There is no second. 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 Hello and welcome to beautiful Bermuda, home of the 35th America's Cup, which begins in earnest today. I'm Alistair Eakin alongside Ken Reid, veteran America's Cup skipper and president of North Sales. The Louis Vuitton qualifiers underway this afternoon. And the island has been building to this moment, a stunning setting, a huge moment for Bermuda, for the sailing and sporting community. So much excitement surrounding the event, the festivities well underway, the sun shining, and a ton of fun to be had over the next five weeks here. It is sold out for day one, the America's Cup Village humming with fans. Today's schedule a cracker owing to yesterday's high winds. Six races, all the teams racing twice. We're underway with USA against France. Some humdingers in there. A rerun of the 2013 match with the Americans against the Kiwis. And we finish with Britain against Japan. And after some pretty wild conditions yesterday with 30 knot winds today, an altogether more benign picture. The sun is beating down on this beautiful scene here on the Great Sound. Wind speeds of around nine to 10 knots. Perfect for foiling, perfect for match racing. And to get us started, we have the America's Cup defenders, Oracle Team USA with Jimmy Pitbull Spithill at the helm up against the French Cuprama Team France, led by the legendary Frank Camas. So the Americans preparing for battle. Four years of hard work comes to fruition right now. Jimmy Spithill, the conductor of the orchestra, and he is batting away the notion that they're the hot favorites to beat the French. Nah, look, I mean, we, we respect every single one of these competitors, and, man, we're not going to let our guard down for once. We know the French have got speed, and they've been improving every day. So, you know, we're going to approach just like every race. We're going to go in as hard as we can, and, uh, you know, hopefully come away with a win. Oracle Team USA, is there added pressure being the holders of the cup? Well, if there is, you wouldn't know it looking at these guys. In fact, if you think it through, the defender can play it any way they wish through this double round robin series. They're on to the finals. Either go all out or hold a bit back. Their choice, and not a bad place to be starting the America's Cup. So the Americans' favorites to take out the French in the opening race. They've been struggling with consistency. They have a lot to do to challenge the defenders. Frank Kamas, he knows he has a tough job to do. Oh, we have, uh, for sure, it's uh, more stressful than uh, a training, but, uh, but also it's, uh, we, we have to enjoy uh, this, uh, this time because it's the first time for us in the America's Cup and uh, it's uh, exciting for all the team. And uh, we want to be uh, concentrated and, uh, <laughs> and accurate uh, uh, during all this race. Group Alma Team France. The pressure's on Frank Kamas and his team, newcomers to this cup campaigning, but not newcomers to winning and big programs. Throughout the practice sessions, France have had two words synonymous with their performance, fast and loose. When they're on the foils, they're ripping, but they fall off their foils more than others, and it's time for Group Alma France to put it all together. So those are the two sets of protagonists for race one. And here is the course that they will be performing on. It is a, a beautiful one, Ken. Talk us through it. Yeah, welcome to the great sound of Bermuda, the perfect amphitheater for this modern day America's Cup. This L-shaped race course features a two mile start sequence followed by the critical high speed blast reach to mark one. Row in four quick legs again in this westerly breeze and we're off to the races, my friend. So we are closing in on the moment of truth, the moment so many people have been waiting for. Both crews looking to get their campaigns underway with an early victory. Let's check in for the first time today with Joey Newton, who's out on our TV chase boat today for us. Joey, a key part of Oracle Team USA. Joey, what are the conditions like out there? Oh, hi, Ken. Hi, Ali. We're looking at about 10 to 12 knots out here on the sound today, which is just perfect for these boats. But the big thing to remember today is the breeze is a land breeze. So it'll be really shifting towards the top of the course and it could be a pretty tough day for the tacticians. Good to hear from you and uh, we'll be checking in throughout the afternoon with Joey. Two great helmsmen going head to head. First up, Ken. Yes, Jimmy Spithill against Frank Kamas. Uh, Frank, you know, the, the, or the Oracle Team USA program is just undoubtedly the most solid here right now. They've been here the longest. 
Frank's got his work cut out. They're the newest here. It's kind of uh, rags to riches for these two guys. 20, 19, 18, so we are nearly there. The moment of truth arriving. All that preparation, all that hard work and hours of commitment about to be put to the test as they head for the entry box. And Ken, the Americans have a slender advantage with port entry. They get to head inside the entry box, marginally ahead. Why is that? Yeah, an interesting rule that was made here before the last America's Cup. These boats are so fast, they let the port tack entry in 10 seconds before the starboard tack entry. And that's mainly because they don't want closing speeds of 50, 60, even 70 knots gets slightly dangerous. Yeah, fair enough. I think that is a, an excellent explanation. A lot of uh, people patching perhaps their first side of uh, these boats on the water. They are a magnificent sight to behold, particularly when they're up on the foils and really ripping. Yeah, Frank Kamas and the Group Arma team was uh, was definitely late coming into the box. That could, look at look at the gap between now these two are fighting against each other, believe it or not, to, to try to block the other guy out at the start, to put it in very uh, crude terms. The whole goal here is to try to block the other guy from having the start that they prefer in order to get to mark uh, one first. The gap opens up really quickly between the two boats. 25 to kill to the boat. So this is it, the moment we've all been waiting for, the Louis Vuitton America's Cup qualifiers underway here on the crystal clear waters of Bermuda's Great Sound. Jimmy Spithill's Americans, of course, defending their cup up against Frank Camas's French. And you call this part of the race the dance, Ken. Yeah, the dance. It, imagine, it, it's been four years for them. They've been flat out practicing for four years. So this is the culmination of so much hard work by so many people. For Frank Kamas, this is like kid in a candy store. This is something that's brand new. Uh, the match racing side of it is brand new, and here he has to go against the champion. Not exactly the perfect spot. And the French closing in behind the Americans. There are frequently some very, very tight crosses through the course of this racing. Some a little too tight for comfort. Yeah, a little. it's all about time and distance. 13 seconds to go, pulling the trigger. Frank will be down to, to Lourdes or the, at the top of our screen, and he's got to just time this thing. So Oracle Team USA and Groupama Team France cross the start line pretty much neck and neck, but the Americans straight up on the foils and taking a slender advantage. It's all about angle and speed to this first mark, and once you're at this first mark, then if you're if you're in control and first to this mark, you have you have the advantage of maybe potentially corralling the uh, the, the person that you're up against. So this is uh, obviously a nice start for the for Team USA and not perfect for Group One. Hey, pretty soft. So the Americans heading to the first mark comfortably out in front the way they like it setting out their stall early here in Bermuda and the French trailing in behind already with plenty of ground to make up we saw a nice smooth turn by Groupama Team France this is really one of the things one of the features in all the practice racing for Frank Kamas and his team is they have been quick but they've been known to fall off their foils at absolutely the wrong time which can cost you literally hundreds of meters at a time You see, you see Team France fly off that foil right there. The, the bottom hull goes in the water, but they popped up pretty quickly and not allowing uh, USA to really take off and, and end this race early. Although, it's, you know, don't, don't let them get much further. Ahead. So the grind is getting to work. And work they will, my goodness, over the course of the next five weeks or so, those guys powering the boat, the hydraulics critical to everything that the boat can manage. And the Americans flying at the outset here as they round gate two. They are looking in very slick order. It is looking like a smooth operating machine right now. Well, 10 knots of breeze, almost 40 knots of boat speed going downwind there. I I'll let you do the math. Four times, you know. Hey, happy normal mode here. Four times the wind speed. See, there you see the looseness of Blue Bomber, something they've been battling ever since they got into this AC-50. Frank 
Kamas at the helm. The Americans flirting briefly with the boundary. You go through the boundary, you incur a penalty and have to slow up. But in the nick of time, heading in the right direction. And the French already can. Kind of hard to see what they can do to reel them in from here. Well, we're going we're gonna to see the French coming around this mark, and we see how loose they, they will get. It's only blowing 10 knots, way too high out of the water, kind of losing control. This could be a function of their foil shapes. It could be a function of, you see the buttons on the steering wheel. They're not going to have to take a shower at the end of the day, for sure. Um, it, you know, it's just, this is a learning, this is for sure a learning sequence for the French in, in this style of cup campaign. They've come a long way, and obviously they're against probably one of the very best in, in these guys. Oh. Swirly breeze, it's going to settle here in a second. On the Oracle Team USA, a team in perfect unison, seemingly. The French working hard looking to find a way, a foothold somehow into the race. And it's just little things. So these Ford, the Ford, uh, the Ford four members, two of which just jumped away, are powering the hydraulic system. On the French, they're all standing up, you notice that. So it, it could be a function of, it's just not as easy to turn those handles as, uh, as it is on Oracle. You notice Oracle stays up on their foils at the top of the screen. They stayed on their foils through that whole tack and group Ama splashed down. You, they're literally losing potentially 100 meters it's every be time that right, dog. <laughs> All about Coming minimizing right. the drag goes without saying. The more time those hulls spend out of the water, the faster this boat will go. And they're capable, capable of going up towards 50 knots. Maybe the 50 knot barrier will be broken at some point over the next five weeks. When you practice for four years, you get pretty slick. And you see those four guys up front. I got my new little toy here. You got those four guys, and they're the grinders. They're in there. They're just powering a hydraulic system that is not only moving the dagger boards around, but it's moving the shape of the wing around. Uh, it, it's both can't sail without the hydraulic functions all working. Let's see if they stay on the foils through this tack. Just splash down, tight, but for the most part, uh, I'd say they probably would say that wasn't their best tack, but it's certainly not the worst we've seen. Light patch here. Wind wise, is it possible for you to tell exactly how consistent the breeze is out there? Is there one part of the course that is well, let's go down more to, favorable? Let's go down to Joey Newton, who's out there on the boat. And, uh, Joey, is there an obvious, uh, correct side of the race course right now, or is it just kind of puffy? It is just kind of puffy, but um, what I'm seeing out here is a bit of a right trend as the boats come up towards the top. So as Oracle was sailing on port tack, you saw them get a header or head away from the breeze and then tack onto the lifted side that they're on now. So I think it's pretty tricky all around, but I'd kind of favour the right. Pressure here, short lift. Going to go left here, be careful. What a beautiful scene it is. A natural amphitheatre here on the Great Sound of Bermuda for what they like to call stadium racing. The crowd's packed in and they've waited a long time to see some top level sporting action they're getting it right here right now little dip of the two hulls over the course of the next month we'll be talking about this bow down trim there, there's all kinds of technique in these boats and it's it's something that we've literally never seen in the sport of sound so the americans under the helmsmanship of Jimmy Spithill, rounding the gate and heading back way, downwind down. once more. Gusty. Looking in commanding form, carrying, of course, the, the point forwards that they secured in the Louis Vuitton Good America's Cup team. World Series with their runners-up position behind Sir Ben Ainsley's British outfit. Take off here, opportunities for them over the next month or so, a bonus point effectively up for grabs for them. If they win the qualifiers, they could ultimately start the match a point ahead. 
you see you see the French kind of up high, down low, up high, down low. That's just a sign of instability. Uh, again, it could be any number of things. It's something that they're going to have to work out, or this is going to be a short couple weeks for, for the French. Long way home already for Frank Camas and the French team. The last team to start preparing, really, weren't they? Can the uh, the lowest budget arguably of all the uh, teams out there as well? So the hydraulic system powered by the grinders, and you'll notice that Tom Slingsby there is on the the pedal bike, and then the others up front are all powering with their arms. And they're hedging their bets, really, the Americans. <laughs> I think they don't think he's getting enough of a workout. So they're, they're, this is a multi. They're multitasking. Now this is. Listen, uh, we're, we're going to see. We're going to see the New Zealanders here uh, in, in a little while. And the New Zealanders showed up with a bunch of bicycles. Instead of those arm-powered grinders, they showed up with a bunch of bicycles, thinking that their leg muscles were that much stronger. Well, not only has uh, Team USA kind of adapted part of that, but it's also allowing. Uh, Tom Slingsby to get his weight further aft in the boat. They think it's an advantage to actually move the center of gravity aft in the boat and get him to do his job downwind, especially from back on that uh, bicycle. They need a grinder. They need the power to keep coming in. So that's why they threw the bike in the back of the boat. Looking unlikely. What a spot. What a vantage point. Uh, what a day they should be having. The island has been buzzing for some weeks about this event. And they really have embraced it here. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to take the depth if you got it. Okay, switching back. Time. Could be an eagle coming. There's yep. Jimmy Will be an eagle. Youngest skipper eagle to win the up. America's Cup back in 2010, Three, age just two, 30. Of course, going for three in a row potentially as they head for gate four. Board up and four, going well. Three, two, Again, looking to stay one, up on eight. the foils all the way through the maneuver. Okay, settling in. So did you hear that? He said, could be an eagle coming. I think what an eagle meant was they tried to, they kept the boat out of the water by actually putting the weather dagger board now, the dagger board on the high side. We didn't quite see that, but I have, I've never heard that phrase. And frankly, we're going to be learning all about how to sail these boats. Yep. I've never seen that exact maneuver done. All of these maneuvers are incredibly synchronized. Many of the teams actually have built exact mock-ups of their boats in order to do teamwork drills just, just ad nauseum. I mean, over and over, because any little slip up means you come off your foils, you come off your foils, and you see what happens. It turns into big gaps very, very quickly. French had a tough time of it in the World Series in the lead-up to Bermuda. Some decent starts. They had their best results in light air. Just one third-place finish, one podium finish for them during the course of those events. And they are a long way back here. Not that there's an easy draw amongst any of these teams, but if you're France and you saw when the when the when the pieces of paper were pulled out of the hat, it's like, oh boy, <laughs> this is not exactly how we were hoping to start. Yep, they're up against the defenders, of course, in this race, race one. They will be back in action shortly as well in race three against the Kiwis, Emirates Team New Zealand. A baptism of fire. Sold out here on day one. As many as 11,000 people on site, and of course, Huge numbers out on the water as well in their boats. So 2,000 boats assembled. Some rather swankier than others. Yeah, from super yachts down to, to eight-foot rubber dinghies, you know, and everything in between. It, it's, I'm not sure who has the best vantage point, but uh, I'm guessing that the champagne might be a little better on the super yachts than that dinghy. Light here. 
The dagger board, you see the wild shapes of these foils. The evolution of not only how they've sailed, they sail these boats, but the evolution of the speed and the technical design features and engineering features of all these foils below the water and above the water. Remember, the hulls are identical one designs. The foils below the water and how they shape the wing the above the water the are the only differences on these boats. And then, of course, the systems, the hydraulic systems in order to, to power these, these uh, incredible machines. Copy. Good pressure here. Shouldn't be too much of a header, if anything, good angle. already in the of Team France and remember by the end of today potentially they might well have had a fifth of their entire America's Cup challenge. It, all of a sudden with the two races today and two races tomorrow they're almost they they're potentially remember one boat goes home after this whole thing Oracle goes through to the finals one of the challengers goes home at the end of this double round robin. You know, the, the, there's no room for error here. These guys got to come out of the blocks fast because, yeah, there is no room for error. Missing a lot of. Okay, pressure coming on. I got a snot lane. One more maneuver. It says on the box we are on the Americans. So high groove out of it. Their stability, for the most part, See what can, we can do. exemplary really Wait when down. you contrast it with the variability of the French. High groove as much as you got and. Weight down low. That's the voice of Tom Slingsby, the tactician. He's he's uh, back after the group right now. He's this guy right here. So nobody, everybody grinds. Uh, the tactician's grinding just as much as the guys that are on there, just specifically to grind, powering this system. You notice how stable they are, high and low. They're they're really not flying up in the air, and they're not and they're not dropping down dramatically. Here it is. Stand by. That stable flight obviously is is very very effective. Not necessarily as easy as it looks as well, crossing the platform at high speed with the boat being manipulated round, sometimes tight corners as they head for the gate once more, closing in on victory. Setting up for a dive pretty quick out of this. So through the gate. And downwind for the final Stand time. Stand by, John. You're going to get a heading pressure here. Heading pressure. The workload these guys get through okay. is something to behold. They really do have Happy. to dig very, very deep. And given that all the teams are Happy. racing twice today, we may, may well see some rotation through the squads. Okay. A lot of firsts in this cup. You know, we're, we've never seen foiling the way we're, we're seeing foiling. Sure, we did in San Francisco, of course, but nothing like we're going to see here. The Holy Grail, the seeing the unicorn of foiling per, uh, per se, is, is people are talking about going around this course being 100% on top of the foils all the time, actually never splashing down. That's what a lot of the teams think we're going to see by the end of this uh, month-long campaign. Big gaps and certainly the learning experience for, for Frank Moss and his team. Frank has won the Volvo Ocean Race. He's, he's been the fastest uh, boat around the world. You know, huge 110-foot trimaran. This is a new game, the America's Cup, the match racing, the foiling. This is a new game for these guys, and, and certainly they're learning, and, and hopefully they're back next time with a with a more polished effort. Now, I'm not I'm not counting them out. Don't don't get me wrong, but clearly uh, we got a, a little bit to a little bit to learn. So a learning curve for the French, but looking far into the distance, the Americans stretching out towards the finish line. Jimmy Spithill has run a tight, tight operation. And they're going to be very difficult to haul in during the course of these five weeks. They look at ease on their boat. 
it has the necessary speed. Looks like they've been sailing for four years. You know, I, 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 honestly, I, I know that sounds incredibly basic, but this is a very tested, tough, smart, well-funded program. It looks like they've been sailing for four years, and I don't think they'd expect anything uh, other than that from themselves. They, they are their Back harshest the critics. There's no doubt about that, and I'm sure they're going to pick this race apart. Maybe we go down and, you know, Joey, have, have you seen flaws from your boys out there on the water today? Yeah, Ken, I, I think a few things they'd be unhappy with about that race, actually. The boat seemed really fast. Um, most of their manoeuvres were really good. They touched down a few times in the tacks, and, you know, Jimmy, Tom, and the rest of the boys are hard on themselves. They'll go back and debrief that and um, make sure it doesn't happen again tomorrow. So, by no means a perfect race, but a pretty good one to start the regatta with. Those are the fine margins. Those are the margins that champions the define now. themselves by, and it may well be that the Americans will find themselves lifting the cup in five weeks' time. That a commanding performance as they cross the finish line here on the Great Sound in Bermuda. Race one has been won by the defenders of the America's Cup, and they are off to a flyer. As they finish this race, they're literally, I, I, what would you say, Ali, a couple hundred meters right off of our booth as we look out on Great Sound. You saw them actually touch down before the finish line. There is not a lot of margin of error here as you go as you finish this race. Finish intact because if you don't finish intact, you're going to be in somebody's uh, you're going to be in somebody's lap here on the, on the, on the wall. Tight into the shore. That's the way we like it, so that all the spectators can get the best possible view and feel part of the action, close up and personal. It is actually just a, I, I mean, it is a perfect day. For, for, I think even the sailors, yeah, would, would, would they love maybe a couple knots more breeze? Maybe, but I think, I think for the first day of our Louis Vuitton experience here, this is, is we couldn't have asked for more. So the clock ticking on the difference between the two teams and a fairly chastening experience, first time out for Groupama Team France. Frank Kamas with plenty to do and not a whole lot of time to rectify their troubles. Sweden against Japan next up, and then they are back on the water taking on the Kiwis. It's true, it hasn't been the perfect schedule. Again, these were randomly drawn, not the perfect schedule for for Group Ama, having to sail in two of the first three races here today, but nonetheless, you get what you get, and you got to make the best of it. And uh, I'm sure their coaches are going to be all over them for the next half an hour or so, trying to figure out how to get some more speed out of this boat. Bang. Wow. Oh my it's goodness me! <laughs> this has not been textbook stuff from the French as they cross the finish line, more than two minutes behind the Americans. A tough first race, and Frank Kamas and his crew, plenty, plenty to work on. So the shortest of respites for them, and they're the summary of our opening race here in Bermuda. In the telltale sign, we'll, you, we'll always look at these deltas on the side. It was just a... a gaining as there, there was not a single leg that uh, Oracle Team USA didn't actually gain just means a faster boat you know sometimes you'll look at this and on the upwind legs one boat will be better than the downwind legs and vice versa but in this case that was not it that was not to be uh, had victory then for the Americans and Jimmy Spithill over the French two minutes and 11 seconds quicker Sweden Japan next up So this is how it all began, Ken. Talk us through it. Yeah, time and distance. It was, people are going to probably get tired of us talking about time and distance, but this is not that easy. you got to be up on the foils, going 25, 30 knots, and hit that starting line exactly at, at the right time, and hopefully slightly before your buddy out there. Remember, this is match racing. This is all about just beating one other boat. And we saw the looseness of Groupama out right at, I think that was mark number two at the first gate. 
uh, high, high levels of flight, low levels of flight, certainly just never looked quite as stable, and that's been their MO for the, for the entire practice session. Coming into the finish, of course, ripping, having putting the brakes on. It's almost like pulling up your handbrake as you as you approach the line. You see, there's not a whole lot of distance when you're going 35 knots. Not a whole lot of distance beyond that finish line before things could go very badly. But for Oracle Team USA, things obviously went just fine. So race one won by Oracle Team USA, the defenders of the America's Cup. And now we are looking at the second race of the day, which will be Sweden against Japan. Nathan Outridge against Dean Barker, two crews that have been going really well in practice. The Swedes, arguably the form horses in recent weeks out here, consistently excellent. They've been reliable. They've been tactically very sound indeed. And their helmsman is Nathan Outridge. Yeah, it's nice. First day. Um, great weather for it. And, uh, you know, we're really excited. We've been here for a couple of years and uh, we feel pretty prepared and uh, looking forward to, to getting the racing underway. Well, Sweden's been here at the venue in Bermuda for two and a half years, an amazing amount of time when you think about it. But it has shown in spades during all the practice racing. Stable and fast are the words being used to describe Sweden with Olympic medal pedigree and lots of muscle and smarts. What's not to like about Artemis art racing at this stage? Well, the Japanese have been based here in Bermuda for some time now. They too have shown good form in practice. They have an enormous amount of experience in their ranks, not least in the form of their helmsman, Dean Barker, a veteran of the America's Cup, but no less thrilled to be part of it again. Um, yeah, it, it, it's uh, just as exciting as the first. Um, yeah, to, to be here in Bermuda racing these you know, amazing boats uh, and to get weather like this for day one um, of racing is, uh, is pretty pretty cool. So I think we'll be good to get out there, good to get into it. It's always uh, yeah, a few nerves going into to race one, but uh, I think once you get into the swing of it all, it's, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. So we are preparing ourselves for the second race of the day. And uh, we will be taking a good look at the Swedes and the Japanese. And time, I think, to check in again with Joey Newton. Joey, who's with us out on the water today. Uh, Joey, any changing conditions out there? Hi, oh, guys. I actually think this breeze is starting to build a little bit, which isn't really in the forecast. So maybe some of these teams are on their light air foils. So we might start to see a bit of a difference, in, um, especially on the reaching and downwind here. OK, good to hear vital information from the water side. And again, we've got uh, two very high quality outfits up against each other. Nathan Outridge against Dean Barker. So much to look forward to, Ken. Two guys who are at the top of their game. Yeah, these are exactly right. I was going to say exactly the same thing. They are at the top of their game and they've both been practicing very solidly and have had some amazing races. So the dogfight about to begin once more. The Swedes with the narrow advantage this time, given port entry, Ken. Port entry for the Swedes, you know, it's, it's debated, but thought probably by the teams that the port entry has a bit of an advantage. They get to sail down into the start box, and they get to pick their time when they want to come back. Nathan Outeridge has been practicing his match racing starts probably as much or more than anybody else here in Bermuda. That, you know, that he, he's, he's an Olympic medalist, two-time Olympic medalist, 
But match racing certainly wasn't his forte. Now he's up against Dean Barker, who you could say exactly the opposite. This, this guy may have sailed in more match races than anybody here. So it's uh, it's really a very interesting uh, game between these two guys. So let's have a look at the Japanese team. Never won the America's Cup. A couple of previous attempts back in 1995 and 2000s. But led, as Ken was mentioning, by Dean Barker, won the America's Cup with Team New Zealand back in 2000, but still hurting from San Francisco four years ago when he was on the Kiwi boat and, of course, lost in dramatic fashion. And the dance well underway the inside the entry box, Ken. That is exactly correct. And Artemis turns back at about a minute, 10 seconds. Now it's where do they want to be? You will see one boat typically push the other boat, start pushing them toward the line, trying to get them early. There is the foiling, there's not foiling, there's slowing up, there's speeding down, there's lay lines, there's there's boundaries, there's all kinds of stuff up out there to, to either mess up or succeed at. All while going 35 knots, by the way. <laughs> Easy. Well, it is not for the faint-hearted. And as you can tell from these pictures, there is very little separating these two right now, both trying to get their timing bang on. And Artemis is down on the ley line, so it's very doubtful that Dean Barker will do anything but what's called gap off. He's going to try to stay well up to weather of Artemis Racing and accelerate earlier than they're able to accelerate on the Swedish boat. Let's see if he can make it work. See that little runway? Off they go. Well, the timing immaculate, and uh, the Japanese firing through the blocks ahead of the Swedes. Straight up on the fours, both of them, and steaming along, reaching for Mark 1. Yeah, that was the typical gap. It's called the gapping maneuver in that pre-start. They had enough of a runway to the high side, away from the Swedes. They were able to pull the trigger a little bit early and just get a little better running start. And looks like they're going to be first into this first mark. So the Japanese and Dean Barker, who have been based out here, both crews, in fact, based out here for some time now, the benefit of plenty of local knowledge, but the Japanese out in front of the Swedes at the moment as they round the mark and head downwind for the first time. These should be two very polished teams. I would be very surprised if one of these teams really took off on the other right now. From what we've seen in all the practice racing, and remember, they've had months of practice racing, uh, th these two teams are as solid as any here. Just look at the height. Look how far out of the water Artemis Racing is. The uh, Swedes at the moment looking um, a little bit shaky, Ken. Slightly unstable there, not their best job for sure, but you notice they barely touched the water with that lured hull. So even though it was a, it was quite an unstable jibe, they were still right in the hunt. Japanese boat. On board the Japanese boat, you see Dean Barker in the back of the boat gripping. They're actually hand grips. He's actually, we believe, controlling the fore and aft rake of the dagger boards himself with uh, controls on the steering wheel. There he is right there. You can just see these grips right in that area right there. I got my new toy. Seems like everything I draw looks like a dog biscuit at this stage, but I'll get better at it, I promise. Adam. <laughs> As long as it's just the dog biscuits, we're happy. <laughs> so Adam is racing the Swedish outfit. Already playing catch up to some degree, but now bearing away, looking to steer a slightly different path. As we go through this month of racing, what will be really interesting, you know, in San Francisco, we saw more passes than we've ever seen in Cup history. Uh, in, It'll just be really interesting to see on these 18-minute, very short courses, how dominant being first to the weather mark is. Pace is right up there, isn't it? And they are matching each other, not for not. So we're lucky enough to be able to give you pretty much all angles, all bases covered 
Let's go out to jo Joey. Uh, what do you think? You, you mentioned before. Can you explain a little more to the folks at home for the first time, viewing for the first time, your light air foils versus heavy air foils? What, what, what are you What are you referencing? Okay, Ken. Well, the boats you're allowed four sets of foils. So what most of the teams have done have gone for one set of light air foils, which are bigger, and one set of heavy air foils, which are smaller. The heavy air foils let you get, the heavy air foils let you go faster and have less drag but you don't get the same amount of lift in light air. So it's very much like an F1 car. You can have big aerofoils and have heaps of downforce, but less top speed. Or you can have great big um, aerofoils. It will help your corner. Less aerofoils will make you faster. So I think that's maybe a little bit of what we're seeing here is the Softback Team Japan foils are a little bit better suited to the conditions. Any idea whether which foils either? I'm sure at this stage, teams know exactly what the other foils look like. It, uh, any idea of whether you whether which, which boards these guys might have these two teams? It looks to me like Team Japan have their high speed foils in, and Artemis might have their light air foils in or their low speed foils. So that might be part of what we're seeing now. Actually, seeing you know, this foiling tack technology here, and, and this actually makes sense with what Joey said that they're actually in a bit of a tacking duel. This is something we never saw before. The tacking has become so much more efficient that the old school match racers say, "Oh, you can't, you can't match race these things anymore." This is actually a bit of an old school tacking duel right now. And a Japanese boat. We understand the first, uh, the first to master that foiling tack here in Bermuda, really uh, setting the agenda, setting the pace, and, uh, and everybody else having to try to work it out for themselves. They're the ones who mastered it the first time. You see the rake. Oh, look at the rake change on that dagger board. The in out. Uh, it, it, it's unbelievable what they've learned how to do with these things. This is not simply just throw a board out and spin it into a tack. It, this is. It's unbelievable, the functionality. This is a real tacking duel going on between these two heavyweights. Very impressive. We hope this would happen, and, and sure enough, here we go. How much at this stage of the race can as well as the one looking to try to mess up the, the tactics of, of the other? How much can they try to steal their air, give them some kind of dirty air? Is that a factor right now? Well, it looks to be more so than we've ever really seen in the catamaran match racing. Uh, during the World Series events, even during the last America's Cup, it was about current, it was about where they were positioned in the race course, and a lot of what we call wall-to-wall, -wall, all the way out to the boundary, to the other to, uh, boundary. Uh, this all of a sudden, they're tacking up the middle. They're actually tacking on the other guy and trying to take his air, trying to have disturbed air come off the back of the wing that would affect Artemis. I will. And you described it, match racing is hand-to-hand -hand combat. And that is uh, pretty much what's going on out there. There's Ian Percy, the Swedish team manager and tactician as well. But look, he's having to dig deep and get heavily involved in the the grinding gold medalist of course in Beijing in 2008 and in Sydney 2000 not a lot of tactics going on with Ian Percy right there you can also make a claim that the helmsmen or the drivers are there they have more to do in, in, than in the history of sailing with all the buttons and the throttles and the this and then that and they have to be tacticians at the same time so around the gate, the Japanese looking in fine fettle. And time running out for the Swedes to try to chase them down. It does seem that if you get some kind of meaningful lead on these courses, it really can prove the difference early on. We have to make, at this stage, these guys, I mean, here it is, the first race of their entire event. you got to... This is a standard boat race. You gotta let, the other guy has to make a mistake, and these these top teams are practiced enough that it's pretty rare that we're seeing a mistake out there. Not the cleanest of maneuvers from the Swedes. That is exactly correct. You really saw that both the Japanese and the Swedish, they, they were different. The Japanese probably gained maybe 30, 40 meters on that jive, uh, just with a little bit of instability on the Swedish. 
Systems. It's really, it's a whole new game. The wing trimmer and the driver are the only two people that aren't great. You see hand grips back there. Also, he's not technically using them, but there looks to be hand grips on that wheel as well. Remember, every day these boats come out, they're coming out with innovation. The day that a boat stops innovating will be the day that everybody blows right by them. So they're going to be good days and bad days for everybody. You notice this morning they were out three hours early, came out, tried some things, and went back into the dock. And you never see that. 20 seconds, guys. Day for the sunglasses, a day for the sun cream. Not for this lot. They're busy at work. Only 20 seconds sailing on the new drive. The voice of Chris Draper. Now, this is interesting where the tactician is also the wing trimmer. So Chris can actually look around and be a bit more help. I think the guys that are the tacticians that are grinding all the time, they're going to struggle to, to really be able to give a ton of input to the driver. The driver's going to be much more on their own in that situation. So the Japanese heading for the gap and they will turn upwind for the final time in the race head it boys head it i mean just perfect i, I mean that was just literally perfect it, it, it's first <laughs> it's the regatta now here's a tough this is a tough move that last second jive to try to split and go the other way I mean, looks like they pulled it off just fine Bye, right. That's a Sander. hard move right there. Right? 20 seconds here, big push. How much can we read into the, the boat speed at the moment? Bye, really? Ken, these, these early exchanges Go. that we're seeing one, out one, here one. On, the, on the break sound, you so often find that in the America's Cup, one or two boats just comfortably quicker than the rest. Can we read anything into what we've seen in the, the first race and a half? Well, I think we'll look at we, we have some kind of fun analysis that we're going to be able to do and show people at home. It's hard right now because there's so many maneuvers, there's so many nuances to how these guys are all sailing the boat. So it's hard just to take a snapshot and say, ah, that one's going 26 knots, that one's going 24. We're going to have to analyze the whole race and kind of take a look at more graphically how fast or how slow a boat might be over a period of time. Reasonably comfortable. The distance is not insurmountable for the Swedes right now. But the way these maneuvers are taking place from the Japanese, it seems they have a very, very slick routine. They do have a slick routine. You know, it's, it's shifty out there. The Swedes really beginning to put their foot down on the accelerator here, but they are closing yeah, all but the time. They're attacked behind, though. They're still going to have to tack, and when they tack, they will be well behind. So I, I'm not fully trusting that, uh, that target line at this stage. They're not going slow, though. Joey, have we had a bit of a right-hand shift out there? Yeah, Ken, I think we have, and um, that's why we saw Japan tack a little bit before boundary and get up on top of um, on top of Artemis there. But I think most of this race we've seen has been, um, the differences have been the manoeuvres, and Japan's just looked that little bit tidier at times downwind, I think. He might be able to lop so him here. He might be able to lop him. Attack from the Swedes. And He's turning in uh, close proximity. These two oh, down on each other. other. This is an overlap situation, and Japan's going to have to one. stay clear. And they tack away. Wow, that just happened tack, really tack. fast. 
Artemis is protesting soft, uh, SoftBank Team Japan. Let's see. see, they came off their foils and literally lost 100 meters in a matter of seconds. Incredible. We're just telling you, there's no way they could lose this thing. So, no penalty. Confirming as much. And so, battle is rejoined. Why did that happen fast? That happened. This whole sequence happened unbelievably fast. SoftBank was absolutely in control, got slightly out of phase on the wind shift, and then fell off their foils uh, one, on one tack, on a covering tack. They were covering them, and they had to tack away to avoid a foul, and all of a sudden, Artemis is in control. Welcome to the modern-day America Cup. Unbelievable how quickly that changed. So the Swedes now setting the pace and the dynamic of the race has shifted entirely. But you said this was going to be tight, Ken. These two crews, they know each other very well. They've been practice racing for the last few months out here. There won't be too many secrets between the two. They will have been busy spying on each other at various different moments, no doubt. That's all part of the game. Absolutely. Here, here it is, Artemis comes ripping in from behind, and then Luffs heads, goes head to win, the boat to Lourdes. The boat on the downwind side, which is Artemis racing, can go head to wind if they want to there, but Dean Barker did the right thing. He avoided the collision and just rolled the boat into attack and avoid no harm, no foul. That's what uh, our chief umpire said. And uh, off we go. But control goes to Artemis. Incredible change of events. Fly wheel. Big push. So tight. As we head to the next gate. Nathan Adrich in charge of this Swedish outfit. Raced with them four years ago in San Francisco. And uh, made the comment in advance of the qualifiers here in Bermuda in the America's Cup. You've got to go big or go home. He's going big this afternoon. I'm still stunned how... I mean, that, this says a lot to, to our next month. Nobody's out of a game, any of these games at this stage. I mean, SoftBank, Team Japan was completely in control of this race, and a couple small errors went very badly on them in a very short period of time. Well, Dean Barker is a, a very phlegmatic, calm, assured presence. He's been there, done it. He's seen a lot and, of course, suffered the heartache four years ago. He will know there are plenty of twists and turns to come before anything is decided out here, but it looks as if the Swedes have stolen a march. And I have to make a mistake at this stage. This is where you're hoping... Two maneuvers. You're hoping 70. your buddy out there in the race course just simply makes a mistake. Because if, if, if Artemis doesn't make a mistake at this stage, there's this nothing down, the Japanese are going to do about it. They haven't shown that they've been going significantly faster. They're certainly not going slower, but they haven't gone significantly faster. And they're opening up a decent lead now, the Swedish team. Two drives, boys. Get the 70. Yeah, you're good. Interesting, really, that through the course of the Louis Vuitton America's Cup World Series, they were pretty inconsistent, weren't they? They had three regatta wins, they had four last place finishes, so they were either wholeheartedly up or wholeheartedly down. But now they just seem to be ironing out all those creases. Yeah, they've been here for a while. They've had a multi-boat program. They've had, they've had all the toys to try to make this thing work, and it looks like they've uh, got things fairly sorted, even with, with a subpar... Subpar start. Here they are, right back in the lead. Round the final gate. Not tearing away. What a start! What a turnaround for Nathan Outridge and his Swedish team. They look like they were out of it. And SoftBank Team Japan seem to have all the aces up their sleeve. It was interesting, as they approached that gate alley, you heard Ian Percy say, two more jives to go, let's get to 70. I think he's talking about pressure. Joey, Joey 
Newton on the race course. Is that what he's talking about? How do, they got to get the hydraulic pressure up to a point knowing that they have to do two maneuvers? I'd say that'd be right, Ken, yeah. He'd be talking about the amount of hydraulic pressure that they have stored in one of their accumulators, and they'd know how much oil they use in each one, so they'd know if they didn't get to a certain point, they flat out weren't going to do the manoeuvre, and that really made the turning point of the race, being able to pull off that super hard manoeuvre at the bottom and get a bit of a split going. This guy's ripping toward the finish right now. 37, 38, 39 knots, screaming right at us, right at our booth. Please, fellas, put the brakes on quick enough. I don't think that is their primary concern. They are just concerned about making sure they stretch as far away as possible from the Japanese. A fabulous effort from the Swedish team. Nathan Attridge at the helm. It has been a fascinating duel. Hand-to-hand -hand combat indeed. And at one moment, it looked very much as if they might get involved in actual combat with the two boats coming together, but it is Sweden who crossed the line first. And Outridge and Percy, big beaming smiles across their faces for Dean Barker. Disappointment in their first outing on the Great Sound in Bermuda. Yep, Dennis coming. Just keep the boat still here, guys. While uh, get a chase boat alongside. So victory for Perhaps the most improved team of all of the six, and this is how it shook out. There you go. Better, 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 uh, but close. I mean, look at that. Never a lead of more than 20 seconds, and hopefully this is what we have to show for a lot of racing coming up over the next month. A lot more racing to come, and that type of close hand-to-hand -hand combat. Hopefully France has learned a few things from that first race and come out and give New Zealand a good ride in this next one in race number three for the day. So two down, four to go this afternoon, but that one an altogether different race to the first of the day. A great gap, what we call that gapping start, that nice little running effort before the, the weather boat or the boat closest to us, Japan, got a chance to pull the trigger a little sooner and beat Artemis around uh, mark number one. And we thought it was just home, just easy cooking for Japan. But one bad tank attack a little bit out of phase, and before you know it, they're getting luffed by Artemis Racing. Artemis slowly comes up. They have to give them room and opportunity. They did. Team Japan got out of the way. The head judge said, the head, the head umpire said that there was no harm, no foul, but Artemis was now in control. Coming into the finish again, putting the brakes on a little before the finish line, and really a terrific comeback by the Swedes over a Japanese team that really kind of had the race in hand at one stage. So we can chat with the winning helmsman, Nathan Outridge. Nathan, many congratulations. First win on the board. That must feel good. Uh, talk us through it. What was the key? Uh, I think the key was just keeping close that whole race. It was um, close. We've been saying the racing is going to be close. And yeah, that was a, that was a big one. Um, and it looked like Dean just misjudged that tack position and gave us a sniff. And, you know, we made the most of it. Hey, Nathan, Kenny Reed here. Congratulations, first of all, and you got a lot of races to go, so don't get, don't get too fired up on us. Now, just take us back to when that gap, I mean, we were honestly saying Japan's got this thing in the bag. I mean, even though it was a pretty close race, can you take us through what you think got out of sorts for them in order to allow you guys to come up so quick? It's really shifty out here, like shifting back and forward 30 degrees. And uh, Purse made a really good call to get the split at the bottom gate, which gave us an opportunity to get back into it. And I think we just were really in phase in the bottom half of that course, and they were trying to get back in phase and cover us. And, you know, a few inches here and there, and all of a sudden you, you get an overlap, and then we forced them to tack again, and, uh, and then that was race over. Now, Ian Percy is listed as the tactician. I mean, he's, we'd see he's got, his, he's got his head down. I mean, let, let's face it, the guy... The guy's fum on fumes half the time, for all the right reasons, by the way. I'm guessing you have to be the tactician as well as the driver at the same time. It's a little fearful when it's fast mule. We're, you know, trying to make decisions around the track. Per sort of gives his, his thoughts and his insights, and then he has to help the boys out so that we can generate the energy to sail these boats. But, um, 
you know, if he lays out a good plan, um, it's our job to execute it, and, and Gooby's job really is the eyes out of the boat to, to help him with those decisions. Terrific. Well, congratulations, and uh, we'll see you guys again in a few minutes, eh? Yeah, perfect. Fast racing. Love it. See you later. Nathan Attridge with us and uh, a victorious helmsman. We are now looking forward to France against New Zealand. They are coming thick and fast right now, and it really must feel that way for Frank Camas, the, the helmsman of the French outfit. They are straight back into battle. There is no doubt about it that they would have had coaches and software i mean th th this is the modern day they probably have software engineers changing the software on the boat and how they're going to uh and how they're going to actually sail these boats let's hear from frank Camas, the helmsman good first day it's uh, the they are the finalist of the last america's cup so for sure they are they are, they are a great uh, team and uh, yeah it's a uh, it's a hard day for us but also very exciting for us and uh, we are happy to, to start by that well, for Frank Kamas and his team, the first race was certainly not the easiest race in the world. They're up against the defending America's Cup champion. Now here they have to go against New Zealand in the second race. This is not the draw that they were exactly looking for, but you know what? They're going to have to make the best of it. They're going to have to figure out how to beat a few teams to, to move on into that round of four. So the New Zealanders what of the Kiwis? Peter Burling is their helmsman. He's very excited by the conditions out on the water. Well, it's you know, pretty beautiful out there today. It's quite the, the contrast on yesterday where it was raining and kind of 30 knots, but today you know, the sun's out and it's a bit more like uh, you know what was promised in the brochure. We've got kind of you know, 10, 12 knots and uh, you know, nice flat water, so I'm uh, really looking forward to getting out there and uh, showing what we can do. Well, Emirates Team New Zealand, they're certainly known for innovation. The Kiwis have been doing this for a long time in the America's Cup. Certainly, they kept their tricky tricky cycling power program under wraps, and we'll talk a lot about that. Uh, it, was, it was too late for others to follow us once they broke it out. They have cyclers and not grinders. This is, this is the modern America's Cup. This is a whole new set of terminology and crew work on board. So the beautiful, great sound of Bermuda, and uh, we are ready, ready enough for race three. The action just does not stop out here. We've had USA beating the French. We've had the Swedes beating the Japanese. France against New Zealand next up. Uh, Joey, we've heard regular updates from you through the course of the, the action so far. Tell us about the wind shift. Tell us about the uh, conditions in totality out there. How have they changed from when we first began? Well, we've had a, um, a little bit of an increase in the breeze, Alan, but the breeze has stayed, like I was saying before, it's, it's off the land, so it's super shifty, and that's really what allowed Artemis to get back in that race before. It was a wind shift um, through that great manoeuvre that they did at the bottom, and I think we'll see that continue in this race. The breeze is going to keep shifting around and probably stay at about the same amount that we've got right now. Thanks, Joey. So another great matchup, another great head-to-head, -head, Ken. Kamas against Burling. Exactly right. Frank Kamas against Peter Burling, kind of the, the grizzly veteran, if you can call Frank Kamas a, a veteran, against the, against the young kid. And, and, you know, the kid, wherever he goes, whatever he does, he just simply wins. And let's, uh, let's see if he can keep that tradition rolling here as they enter the Louis Vuitton America's Cup trials. So France with port entry into the, the entry box. And uh, they are going to have to dig pretty deep because they've had very little time to reassemble after that early defeat to the Americans. They're going to put that to one side and recognize that there is an opportunity to be seized here. The Kiwis, something of uh, the dark horse about them. Very much on the outside of the pack, if you like pointedly refusing to sign up to the uh, the framework agreement for the next couple of editions of the America's Cup. They like to plow their own furrow, but they have pedigree everywhere. Winners, of course, of the America's Cup in 95 and 2000. A beaten challenger in 2013 and desperate to put that straight. Frank Kamas actually did a pretty nice job in that last start with his timing, getting to the starting line 
on time. Just wasn't going quite quick enough. A minute, over a minute to go before the start. He's actually reasonably close. Frank Kamas is actually reasonably close with regards to where he is on the starting box. You might see what's called a pushing move coming up here by Peter Burling. He's going to come in from behind and try to force Frank Kamas. Here he is with an overlap to Lourdes. Frank Kamas is very vulnerable right now. There he goes head to win, forcing Kamas to tack, to stay away and not foul him. Not a perfect setup. Twenty-four seconds to go. Kamas is kind of a tough spot. The only Berlin can't pull the trigger too early here. That's one way that he could actually mess this start up. Fifteen seconds to go. Not a. There's literally no place to go for Frank at this stage. And he is bearing down as they head for the start line. Uh, Gentle adjustment from the Kiwis as they head across the start and get up onto the foils. French seemingly being edged out pretty early on. I, I think the whole strategy there was the fact that Group Ama had a chance to dictate when they wanted to come back to the line. They came back so early, it allowed the Kiwis to easily come in from behind, what's called hook them, and take complete control of the starting of, of the starting points. So really a, a tactical masterclass from Pistol Peter Burling, the 26-year-old Kiwi, as they hurtle across the water and round mark one, heading downwind uh, with what already looks like a very, very tough lead for the French to overhaul. So often we've seen in these races, certainly through the course of the World Series, Ken, if you get that early lead at the mark, you can dictate the play, can't you? And then it is perhaps incumbent upon you to, to lose it effectively. You have to make the error. That's correct. You have to make the error, especially when you're sailing against such unbelievably strong uh, programs out here. You've got to hope the person in front makes a big error. And right now, if you're a group mama, you're you're hoping. If you're a group mama fan, you're hoping for for somewhat of a, a miracle right now. That start didn't go exactly the way you were hoping it would. Uh, just as we saw in race one from the French, that instability, that lack of control, perhaps when they are up on the foils, moving at some speed. Not that it's easy. Far from it. But it seems those in greater control. So Joey, going, looking out on the race course right now and looking at uh, uh, the Kiwis, do we think they have their light or their heavy air foils in today? Any idea? They look a little bit smaller, so that would be my best guess. They did have a bit of a moment out of their first jive and lost control, but they've, um, they've got Griff Hummer pretty firmly under control now. He said, I, we, we missed the very beginning of that, but I think he believes it's their heavy air foils. They have big, big light air foils, and, and I would tend to agree with them. We'll probably, we're going to become more accustomed to, to the little nuances of how these boats, the features on all these boats as we go along here. And we're learning just as much as everybody else at home. You look at the angle away from the mark, the red dotted lines back there, and how much higher pointing towards the wind the Kiwis were than the French. They look stable there, don't they? They look solid. We haven't even talked about the bicyclists yet. <laughs> Just a sight that sailors around the world are going to have to get, some, get used to. So there they are, the cyclists. They are working, working hard. The thought is those leg muscles are bigger, are stronger than those arm muscles right there, and, and that's their theory. That's they're pumping, they're, with the amount of muscle, they're they're actually powering up their hydraulic systems more effectively, more efficiently than if they were using their arms. That's the whole theory around. It. Does it detract from 
their maneuverability, their ability to whip across the platform and, and make sure they're in the right place, the right time, the weight balance is right for all the maneuvers. Well, well, certainly the other teams thought so. I, I, if you believe what you read, which, mark my words, you may not. If you believe what you read, these guys have been working on this for a long time. Everybody else supposedly they claimed they looked at it and uh, didn't think it, it, they thought it was going to be bad for maneuvers. But I'll tell you what, in all the practice sessions I've seen so far, these guys' maneuvers look pretty darn slick. So another they example. Also talk about, sorry, uh, Ali, they talk about the windage being worse on these guys, but I, I think the windage could potentially be better. Two guys across. They'll control the dagger boards. Perfect foiling tack. Incredibly stable. Well, I guess just another example of the, uh, the choice of the cycles. Another example of the Kiwis doing things their own way. They don't like to follow the trend. And it is paying off for them at the moment. They look like they have things under control right now. It's, uh, relaxed. <laughs> Peter Burling at the back just looks like he's out for a picnic. Is, uh, I don't think he feels that way, but just quietly controlling things, isn't he? And of course, you, you mentioned every time he's he's in a boat, he is a, a serial winner, the golden boy, really, of New Zealand sailing. Growing this lead at the moment, meter by meter, speed comfortably quicker. And there's boat speed as well. You asked a good question before. Can you just look at simply look at boat speeds on the race course? And I've every time we've we've shown boat speeds, we've seen a couple knots. It's not like the, the days when I sail America's Cups, Ali, and a couple tenths of a knot was a huge gain or a huge loss. Here, here it's a couple of knots are, are big gains and losses. And and day to day, as we saw in 2013 in San Francisco. You can go one, two, three, four knots faster just on a given day with a couple little changes. It's really is a whole new game. So let's uh, let's bring in Joey Newton as we see the New Zealanders rounding the, the third gate and looking in total command. Is there anything, Joey, from your perspective that you would like to see the French doing to turn things around here? Oh, Ali, it's, um, they've got a little bit of work to do. I, I think their boat speed actually looks pretty good, but their manoeuvres are letting them down. So every tack, every jive, they're just losing tens of metres, and they really need to correct that to be competitive. And how quickly is that something you can change? I mean, do, they don't have the time, really, do they, given the, the way these races come thick and fast? They just don't have any more time to get that in place, do they? Can they turn it around in time? I'd like to think if someone can, and to be frank, um, I've done a lot of sailing with Frank, um, and actually was part of the winning team in 2010, so... I think they could do it. It's, it's a tough, tough road from where they are now, but um, I'd sure like them to see it turn around a little bit. So really, Ken, I mean, we talk about the, uh, the design race, the technological race. The, the French seem to have everything in order in that regard. It is simply the boat handling. Yeah, but that could be the tech. The, it, it, it's all together. It's all punched together. You know, you can't just say it's one thing or another. I think it's it, it's a little bit of everything. We were talking to Russell Coots about the total package the other day, and. He was explaining to us, you, it's really hard to isolate one thing. It's all one big ball, and if you don't, if you don't get it all working, all those components working at the same time, it's really not going to happen for you. Run side. So it's going to be tough for them mentally as well as physically yep. now, isn't it? After yeah, be happy with it. three races of the day, in. the French will know that a, a fifth of their challenge is done. The schedule perhaps not working in their favour either, but the Kiwis really driving home the advantage now. Not to, as we learned in the last race, that uh, Japan against Sweden don't let the foot off the, the gas pedal. There's no doubt about that. We thought that race was all but, all but done, and, and man, did that turn around quick. Yeah, no, numbers are good. Yeah, happy to go. Yeah, keep going, keep, keep going just a little faster. Four to go. Three, two. 
We're talking about jive, uh, trying to pull off the jive here and when to jive. I'm sure they have instruments that are telling them exactly where the lay line or the closest line, the most efficient line towards the mark is for, for the boat to sail. Uh, you know, this is the automation of these boats, and I'm sure as we as we start to loosen these guys up a little bit and get into the and get into their boats and their systems, it'll be fun to uh, to have a little bit of a tour around and see and see how these things really work. So a little bit of a, a dousing for the cyclists. They'll probably be glad of that as they <laughs> pound away, powering that boat up and round gate four. Upwind. One more time. There's such a thing as elegance uh, in these boats, in these violent kind of, I, I think that's the right word, violent boats. Watching them just in perfect balance. And be careful here if you're Emirates Team New Zealand. All of a sudden, you don't want to get pinned up against this boundary and foul uh, group bomber. They jive away and, and make it a little easier for them. So it is it, watching these boats fly. It looks so smooth and graceful. But I tell you, when you're on board the boat, it is some kind of violence just shaking the g-forces on board the boat the all these teams have had people flying off the sides during the maneuvers it can get a little dicey at times, i can tell you that yes frank kamas himself had a, a nasty accident didn't he a, a little while back lost his uh, lost his footing and uh, fell in the water flew off at 35 knots hit the rudder nasty nasty injury to his foot to work very hard to uh, to recover from that to take his place at the helm. Interesting to hear him talking uh, ahead of the event here in Bermuda about the fact that the great strength of, of his crew, he believed, was the fact that they, in a way, were able to approach the whole project with a blank sheet of paper. They could innovate, they could think outside the box, they're not necessarily steeped in America's Cup tradition in the same way that so many of the other crews are. He saw that as a, a massive positive, a plus point. At the same time, I wonder, it has to be the right mix. I wonder if he would take a little more uh, veteran leadership. So the Kiwis powering forwards, beating challenges in 2013. And a huge culture of sailing back home on the north of the South Island. There's an enormous amount of interest generated there over the, the outcome of this event here in Bermuda. Incredible foils on these boats. The development that's gone on there. You know, we're, we're talking about the the pedaling, the pedal power, the cyclists, and it's really the whole different style, the different type of crew member. On the, I can't think of the last time. We'll have to do a little homework on this. It might be 2007, the last time Ray Davies wasn't on board a Louis Vuitton or America's Cup race for a Team New Zealand. We're gonna have to look into that. But it's just amazing how the well, Joey Newton. I mean, Joey Newton is with us today because Joey, tell us. I mean, the, it's, it's it's aerobics. It's it's power. It's it's all of a sudden the jib trimmer, the nuances of jib trimming. You were telling me you easier or easier trim the soft sail up front, maybe an inch. Yeah, that's right. And um, the boats have evolved, and they're getting faster and faster and faster, and they they make bigger demands on the horsepower you can put into them. So, you know, in my case, I'm simply too small to sail these boats, um, and the guys that we have turning the handles. Uh, top level uh, Olympic level athletes and across the board the teams have um, gone to people like that to, to power them they're that hard to sail give us a, a flavor Joey if you can about the, the the difference in the training techniques and the the work that everybody has to do behind the scenes in the gym no doubt early mornings late nights you know how that's changed over the course of the last few years in particular well, it's sort of the America's Cup has changed from last campaign. Um, we had very traditional America's Cup campaigns where you'd sort of go to the gym in the morning once, spend long hours with the boat, 
um, do a big sailing day and then go home. And, and that's been forced to evolve into a more professional athlete sort of training regime or Olympic regime, if you will. So it's much more about you train, you eat, you rest, you sail, you rest, you train. And that's pretty much us every single day. I'd say all of these teams are training at least twice a day on top of their sailing. And in between that is eating and resting. And um, the more traditional sort of boat work side of things has gone by the way. There you have it. <laughs> okay, we're done now. You know, it's. Uh... Well, they are some remarkable athletes, aren't they? And, and if, by the way, if you see Joey standing on the street corner, yeah, you say, there's the, "There's the fittest dude you've seen in a long time." You know, <laughs> I'm not trying to blow smoke, Joey, but uh, it's not like you're exactly chopped liver. Yeah, thanks, Ken. <laughs> He's changing on a number of different ways, and of course, all those grinders have to have a, a keen sailing instinct too. They have to know exactly what their role is and how it is in tune with everybody else on the boat. And the communication systems are key as well, aren't they, Ken? How the helmsman communicates his messages to the rest of his team. That's exactly right. The, the communication systems have become, become fantastic. I mean, back in my day, you'd be yelling to the bowman and yelling to the guy in the pit, you know, and now it's conversational tone it keeps the whole the whole level of anxiety on board the boat at a completely different level so the, the communication systems have, have become quite good and uh and have certainly helped these guys sail the boat at a much more effective uh, rate yep it looks so smooth alley when we're looking at these side views and then you look at the other views and, and it is I think violent. I think violence the right word. It's incredible. Yeah. Ryan, Ryan, just, we would have got any earlier. We simultaneously, and the Kiwis epitomizing that right now. Stretching ahead and heading for the finish line. And very good, Nick. Looking to make sure that the challenge is a lasting one here at the America's Cup in Bermuda. Peter Burling, calm head, youngest sailor at the 2008 Olympics and uh, earmarked for greatness from a very, very young age. Uh, a natural, instinctive, unflappable sailor and uh, a great team alongside him. They are they're looking the real deal, Ken. They are definitely looking the real deal. They're thought to be certainly a favorite once they finally did show up in Bermuda and started training with the group. They immediately were on pace. They did a lot of training by themselves in Auckland, back in New Zealand. I think part of it was probably financial, saving a few bucks, but part of it was maybe keeping some of this stuff to themselves a little more effectively and not in the peering eyes of all around, all the other teams around in uh, here in Bermuda. I'm sure most teams had some prying eyes on them in Auckland, but nonetheless, they showed up here fast and smooth and Obviously looking pretty solid against the French at this stage. It was 38 39. Knots amongst friends oh, zipping across the great sound, heading right at our glass booth. Well, able to enjoy this final run, the Kiwis. A big statement made by Peter Burling and his team, leading his crew over the finishing line, miles in front of the French. And laying down the gauntlet, that's what we've got, he's saying. What else does everybody else have? Terrific stuff from Emirates Team New Zealand. And the French left trailing in their way. But as we talked about in that last, in the race that uh, USA was up against the French, I guarantee you that the, the Kiwi uh, all the Kiwi higher brass, all the Kiwi coaches will have all kinds of stuff to critique in that race and how they sailed the boat around the race course and constantly trying to get more speed. You look at a, a dominant performance like this and you think to yourself, what, what else could they possibly do? Well, I, listen, there's a long way to go here, folks, and everybody's getting faster by the day. Everybody's trying new systems every day, and uh, there's no way these guys are going to stop trying to innovate. Good day. Hey, sir, don't worry. Then what I do, 
So Alicia challenge amongst other things for Frank Kamas. Who knows that they've got to turn this around pretty quick. It's there to be part of the playoffs. One team, of course, go home at the end of the qualifiers. And the defenders, Oracle Team USA, go straight through to the match. Challenger playoffs. There you go, do something. Split into two sections, and Frank Kamas will be desperate to be part of that equation. It's a big number here, though. This is going to be well over two minutes around a, essentially a 20-minute race course. It's a big, it's a big number. That's a there's a tall hill to climb here for the French team. There's no doubt about that. And you know, at, at this latest stage, you know, oh, how, how can you? How many rabbits can you pull out of a hat at, at one time? I don't know how many other silly comments I could make here on it, but it's it's not going to be easy for these guys. I can tell you that. Not for lack of effort. No that is that. for sure. No doubt about that but really a question of belief for the French at this point, amongst other things. They need to try to ensure that they still believe that anything is possible as they cross the finish line and uh, plunge into the water. It's very slider. clear there's only one way to stop the boat. <laughs> Everybody's doing the same thing. <laughs> so, victory for Emirates Team New Zealand. Let's have a word with their skipper, Glenn Ashby. Glenn, congratulations. You uh, you took an early grip on the on that one and um, and saw it through pretty comfortably in the end. Yeah, look, it's great. Great to uh, obviously get a uh, you know the first race under your belt. I'm sure all the guys that are you know doing their first one are pretty happy to to, to put it to bed. But um, no, the boys sailed the, the boat really nicely and certainly very nice to uh, you know be out here on the Great Sound and be uh, kicking off the event in uh, such great conditions. Hey, Glenn, Kenny Reed here. Congratulations. A lot more to go. So, uh, you know, it's fun to watch. I got to tell you that. And I'm guessing that your coaches, even though it was a dominant performance, will have plenty of critique at the end of that race. Is it fair to say? Yeah, absolutely, Kenny. Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, everybody's uh, going to be learning a huge amount over the next uh, few races. And obviously, we haven't done a huge amount of yachting in the last uh, couple of weeks, you know, really since being here and haven't done a lot of racing against other boats. So for us, it's definitely a learning experience every time we go out there. And our learning curve is going to be pretty steep. So looking forward to the next few days, for sure. Thanks very much for your time, Glenn. Many congratulations. Thank you. And we look forward to seeing the Kiwis in action against the, uh, the USA pretty shortly. Great Britain against Sweden. Next up, New Zealand, USA, and then Great Britain, Japan, finishing things off for us in the first stage of the round robins at the Louis Vuitton America's Cup qualifiers. So here's the scene at the Great Sound and the Moroccan Modern America's Cup truly an international contest, as we know. Not only do we have teams representing six nations, but within each team, from the shore crew to the designers and the athletes on board, there are competitors from across the globe. But perhaps no one can claim a more personal nationalistic uh, connection to this competition than the Brits. In 1851, the Americans came to their home turf and stole the cup away. It has never been back. Leading the charge to right that wrong this year is Sir Ben Ainsley. I've always tried to be quite clear about what I'm trying to achieve and, you know, then being incredibly determined to try and achieve that. You know, certainly I demand very high standards of myself and of the people around me and that can sometimes be, be difficult, but you have to give it up everything. You have to be quite ruthless and determined to achieve what you want on the water. When I'm racing, I'm going for it. I'm going to give it everything to do whatever it takes to win. I've always tried to be someone who leads by example rather than saying a lot and uh, coming up with a lot of hot air and really it's about getting out there at the cold face and um, working with the team and making it happen. I'm a very patriotic person. You know, this team is very much about being the best of British and trying to right that wrong in our maritime history. And that's a big driver, it's a big motivator. Doing it for Queen and Country as well on some of those hard, tough days, I think that makes a difference. There's always pressure in, it, in any sport and there are expectations. 
I think the best way to deal with it and my own personal approach is that if you go into an event knowing that you put absolutely every, every last ounce of effort into it, there's nothing more that you could have done in the time frame that you had. If you, if you take that approach, then the pressure generally takes care of itself. So Ben Ainsley, the most decorated Olympic sailor of all time, and of course a man with uh, a very real mission, something of an obsession for him now, the, uh, the British charge on the America's Cup up against Nathan Outridge and Sweden. Next up, they of course secured that excellent win in race two over the Japanese. Ah, it's going to be a great race, uh, you know, a lot of good mates uh, in the Artemis team, Ian Percy, um, you know, the team leader, manager there, uh, he and I are, are obviously great mates, so good rivalry, they're going to be very tough, they've been going really well in the practice sessions, they've got great boat speed, uh, so we expect a, a tough race, but we're up for it. Land Rover BAR, certainly the pride of Great Britain, Sir Ben Ainsley he has this large and very well-funded upstart program for the first cup campaign for Britain since 2003. But there's always growing pains and with brand new programs that you never know what's gonna happen. It is rumored that they are very good in maneuvers, but have been lacking a bit of pace in the practice racing, yet to be seen. So a very real challenge for Land Rover BAR in the form of Artemis Racing, the Swedish outfit and uh, Nathan Outridge is the man in charge. He doesn't buy into the idea that Ben Ainsley's outfit are too slow to challenge. No, I think, think all these boats are fast enough to win a race and, um, you know, we just need to treat each competitor as if they're equal boat speed, equal performance in terms of their handling and I think if we do our job well on the boat, um, we should be able to win the races and, you know, we're, we're more focused on what we can actually do right now than other teams, and uh, if he thinks that, then that's fair enough. So what did we learn from Artemis Racing in that first race, Ali? Well, first of all, they weren't probably very happy with their start. This is a time and distance. This is something that uh, driver Nathan Outeridge has been working at very hard, but we learned that they're fast and they're patient, and they keep it close, and they wait for the other team to make a mistake. Ben, you better not make a mistake or they're going to beat you. Pretty straightforward equation, and uh, the two crews readying themselves, preparing to line up and go head to head. So let's uh, let's check in with Joey Newton again. Um, Joey, we keep asking this question, but it is the most valid one, isn't it? Conditions are they shifting? Are they similar? I um, actually think they're pretty similar. They're, the breeze is a little more patchy up towards the top of the course than it is down the bottom. So you'll see the boats moving around a lot more as it gets up towards the top. It'll be a really interesting race. Um, BAR have been sailing really, really well. They might be lacking a bit of boat speed, but we saw Artemis is super quick, but they made a few mistakes in a few of their maneuvers. So overall, it could be anyone's race. Yet again, we've got two guys going head to head that we can really relish this duel, Ken. Yeah, Portak, Portak uh, for the uh, GBR team, getting across 10 seconds before the Swedes get across. The Swedes are a little bit late start the dance that two minute dance in the starting box trying to outmaneuver the other guy just like we saw in that last race with the kiwis really putting themselves directly in front of the french i mean that's the ultimate start you got the guy starting right behind you nothing they can do each boat will certainly be looking for that sort of advantage got a little island in the way down there you got all kinds of obstacles you notice they all go way down to the far corner of the box, of the starting box alley. It's, uh, the boats come back so fast that they, they actually go away for a minute and 10 seconds or so. They're not even at the edge of the starting box and they're easily getting back in time. Important probably, Ken, to let everybody know as well that although you can see the boundary there on the screen, that, that, is, that is in a way not a conventional boundary. It's not like once they are out on the course proper, where if they cross that boundary, go through it, they incur a penalty. Not the case in the pre-start. In the pre-start, that is not the case. They can use it if they want to. It's a little complex. They can use it if they want to. They don't have to use the boundary. 
Here we have these two boats, again, jockeying for position down to that line. This is what's called the lay line, that yellow line down there. They're going to put themselves down. One of them will go down to that line and, and try to force the other guy into a spot that they don't want to be in. So G where do you want to be? Well, GBR is down towards that line right now. Artemis is extended well forward on them. This is going to have to be a gap off start for Artemis. Artemis is going to don't want to be too quick too quick to get up toward that end. That's for sure. That's their only danger. Now it's just time and distance. Send it. Try to get toward the start as quick as possible. And the timing is good from both crews. Land Rover BAR led by Sir Ben Ainsley. The British Challenge and Artemis Racing with Nathan Artridge at the helm. And so this looks like being a very, very good battle as they reach across to the first mark. Pure drag race. Pure da drag race. Remember, the inside boat, or, or uh, the Brits right now, will have room to go around that mark. They have an overlap. They're going 41 knots. doesn't look like they're very slow right there. <laughs> well, so much talk in advance of this event as to whether Sir Ben Ainsley and the British were holding one or two tricks back. Were they keeping rabbits in the hat? Maybe it's time to produce them as they head downwind for the first time in the race. So it is the Brits in front. It's the Brits in front. Let's go down to Joey for a minute. Joey Newton, was there any pace there that you haven't seen before? Is that fairly standard for the Brits? No, I cannot do that. That's the fastest I've seen the Brits go on the reach. And maybe what we are seeing is Artemis on those light air foils and paying a bit of a drag penalty on the reach. Uh, I mean, Japan were quicker than them, and now BAR were quicker than them along the reach. So it may just be purely a poor foil decision for the day's condition. That's an interesting call, Joey, isn't it? I mean, particularly because they've been out in the water already once this afternoon. Are you surprised by that call? No, not really. The forecast was to be a little lighter. Right? For all the teams, I'm sure they were right on their crossover between big and small. Um, once they're in in the morning, they're in for the day. So um, even though they're out in the morning, I, I think they're pretty much committed to that call. We'll see. Um, Artemis will be going really well around the course, so this race for sure has got plenty to go. Copy that. Right, extending. Five seconds till turn up. Wait your boundary here, please. Legendary competitive spirit. And it's very much his life's work now, having put together the Land Rover BAR team subsequent to 2013 as they ran gate two with a, a narrow advantage. The first impression would have to be the. Uh the demise of the Brits seemed to be slightly exaggerated at this stage, but it's early in the piece, there's no doubt about that. About 10. So the course split, and the uh, two teams heading in separate directions. Ken, is that a, a, a choice of, of trying to pick out the best wind? Well, for sure it's that, but at the same time, if you're Artemis Racing and you're behind, it's really not, in, unless there is a large wind shift out there, gaining that split at the bottom gate will be something we'll be talking about ad nauseum. And if you're behind, just following behind the other guy is not very easy. You're in his wing wash, you're in their control. All of a sudden, there's really not a whole lot of passing lanes. So gaining that split at the bottom gate, if you are the boat behind, certainly is an advantage. Yeah, I'm happy to keep going here. It's not exactly, you know, the Swedes aren't going slow here. There's no doubt about that. They're doing very similar things to they did in the first Japan race. They're just keeping it close, waiting for a mistake, and kind of probably sniffing out their boat speed a little bit, see where they stand. Let's just wait for the breeze to hit. So again, the, uh, the control system's as complicated as ever, as, uh, as baffling as ever to the outsider, but there's an awful lot going on with that steering wheel, Ken. It's not a, it's, it's not a, a simple equation for Sir Ben Ainsley. We saw him yesterday, well, a couple of days ago, in practice, really struggling with that control system because it's obviously quite a new one. Yeah, I think he has those same sort of wheel grips that we saw on Japan, for sure, and that we've seen on Oracle, uh, on the Americans. There we are. Uh, it's hard to kind of zoom in whether he has whether he has his hands on on any sort of a grip there. Um, but it, it's it's yeah, it's kind of tough to tell. 
there's buttons all over the place. I mean, there's <laughs> stuff going on there. We got buttons, yeah, hooks, we got buttons, we got grips, we got all kinds of stuff. Go back. It's certainly not easy for uh, about for the modern day driver, the modern day helmsman, just okay, to go steer the boat around the race course. Those days are long gone. You were even suggesting, weren't you, that some of those buttons might just be there for show, just to confuse the opposition. <laughs> Setting up. Somebody somewhere Five, has been two, spending a one, great deal of time go. trying to pick up the uh, the nuances, and there will have been men with binoculars on chase boats over the course of the last month or so out here. There's no doubt, and this is a big split. This is pretty much both teams on either side of the race course right now. If you're GBR, this isn't perfect. You know, there could be a wind shift that could go against you. This is not necessarily corralling your competitor, but at the same time, it doesn't look like they're getting any further behind. I think everybody out here right now is very impressed with the Brits because when I say there were rumors of a slow boat, there were plenty of rumors of a slow boat. And this does not look like a slow boat right now, especially knowing how well Artemis has been sailing over the last month or so. Well, it would be trademark Ainsley, wouldn't it? To just come out of nowhere blindside everybody be underestimated okay are, as a fellow Brit are you suggesting that he's been sandbagging all along and has everybody fooled is that where you're going with this I have absolutely no clue whatsoever but I like the notion <laughs> 10 seconds I applaud the notion not just as a Brit in terms of sporting excellence in terms of competitive drive and spirit there are few to match him some of those who can are out there on the water right now. Nathan Outridge would be attributed all the same kind of characteristics as it's all hands to the pumps. I tell you, I haven't seen this boat even splash the water yet. This is very, very impressive. I have not actually seen the hulls go in the water yet. So there's that, that unicorn of racing, you know, that 100% that out of the water all the time. Joey, have you ever gone around a race course on one of these boats yet without ever touching with a with a one of your uh, hulls? Yeah, we have. Um, I've, there's probably I'd say three or four of the teams here have done full laps uh, without touching down. But as yet, we haven't seen a boat do it in a Louis Vuitton race. So the first boat to do it, it'll be a pretty big feather in the hat. Happy using this pressure all the way to boundary. You might be seeing it right now. You've got to be impressed, Joey, with with the Brits right now, don't you? Especially with uh with all the, I don't know, I, I, I guess just a, plenty of rumors floating around about their early demise. Yeah, to be honest, I'm really, I'm really surprised and super impressed. But, you know, when you think about it, we're sort of we're talking about Ben Ainsley. By any measure, he's one of the greatest yachtsmen that's ever lived. So if anybody was going to come out with something like this, it was going to be Ben. Well, the lead is a, a pretty healthy one at the moment. Sweden in the hot pursuit and an intriguing battle lying ahead because this race is far from over. Speed of the Swedes is decent at this point. We know full well the Swedes are not slow. That humming sound for everybody at home, new to, new to foil uh, viewing is, is the actual foils themselves. A slight tiny bit of cavitation, a little bit of a vibration that comes off of these and make that wild humming sound. Big hit for 15 seconds, I'm going to look. Lay line coming quickly, 10 seconds away. Giles Scott, the tactician, there he is jumping yeah, in. Yeah, it's just a different world. You know, he stops grinding for a second, jumps in, says, we're almost there. Okay, go ahead and jive. And I think we're that is one of the most impressive line, things about these guys, the isn't line. it? It's the, the ability yeah. to work so hard, almost to, to maximum capacity, That's lung capacity. Good. They're going to be uh, busting every sinew they have. But then to be able Play to think line, straight and make the right decision three. and assess their okay, situation accurately, that is, that is proper skill. Different world. Oh, touched. Joey, you're off the hook. I think I just saw their hull touch, so I think the record is still available. <laughs> okay, I think it was a pretty, um, you're pretty harsh there on them. Hey, that's our job. Welcome to the media, son. That's our job. 
These foils are incredible. We see a little, a little okay, edge of it. The, here, the tip of the foil we'll actually has another slight angle to it. The nuances of the of the foil shapes are just incredible. This is a good, this is a healthy lead. This is a this is a big surprise. This is a big surprise right now. Around the gate. The grinders. Full throttle and Land Rover BAR under Sir Ben Ainsley making very good progress. The Swedes in hot pursuit. But they have plenty of ground to make up and not a whole lot of time. So the Swedes chasing, chasing for all they're worth at the moment. Victory for them in their opening race over the Japanese. Quite a twist in the fifth leg of that particular race against Dean Barker's SoftBank Team Japan. Have they got something else here to pull out? You see that dagger board moving like crazy, in and out, up and down, fore and aft, trying to keep that boats foiling through these maneuvers, keep the drag of the hulls out of the water through the maneuvers. A couple hundred meter, 250 meter lead right now to the Brits, extending. Worth mentioning as well, Ken, the Louis Vuitton America's Cup World Series was won by Sir Ben Ainsley's team. And they had two points that they take into these qualifiers already. So they have two points on the board. They'll be looking to add another one to that here. But if they uh, end the day with three or possibly four points to them, Waiting for the lefty. that would be a thrilling start. They'll put them in the box seat to uh, head towards the Challenger playoffs. For the One against four and two against three. Oracle goes on, goes away. Oracle is not part of the group Let anymore. Let this settle. He stays with tacking. First against fourth, coming out of this double round robin, and second against third. Exercise, isn't it? It's <laughs> just incredible. And, and beautiful Numbers. Tactics. Beautiful maneuvers here. Very, very impressive so far from the Brits. What a setting. What a setting. Still harvesting, the boys. America's Cup. Louis Vuitton qualifiers and Land Rover BAR with Sir Ben Aisley at the helm are really beginning to enjoy themselves out here, extending their lead over the Swedes. It was widely suggested that their boat speed was going to be a major issue out here. Maybe not. Oh, that guy. You're happy to be here, no, aren't you now? I, 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 I'm going to have a heart attack watching them. Never mind actually trying to do it. The ley line. It's puffy, Joey. I mean, you can see the, the radical change of direction sometime in the boat. Uh, that just means pressure, right? Wind, actual wind pressure out there? I think we're seeing pressure changes and shift changes up here. The breeze that's swirling around the land and coming down the course is changing direction one as in, well. One in. With these boats, they're going so fast that from someone just watching from the outside, it's actually really hard to see if it's pressure or angle that's changing. But, you know, whatever way you look at it, Ben's doing a pretty good job of managing it. Two guys down the bottom. It keeps stretching away from Artemis. Is that kind of standard, Joey, here on this course? I mean, you, you, you will have raced out here many times. Do we expect the, the, the puffiness, the, the changeability to, to pretty much be a feature over the next few weeks? From this direction especially, Ali, um, this, this, what we're seeing today, is incredibly typical of the beautiful summer. So expect to see a lot more of this, and it's great for the racing because you see lead changes. Joey, okay. what kind of heart rate, you know, we're, at some stage I believe we're going to have heart rate monitors on uh, on the crew as they go around so we can see what kind of physical freaks that, that these guys really are at this stage. Where, where are they in capacity? Give, me, give us a couple numbers. I'd say for these guys, 
they'd aim to do the whole race at an average of about 85% of their max. So, um, depending on where their max is. But for what you're seeing, Land Rover BAR and, um, and the Swedish team at the moment, they've probably gone above that as they do more of these tacks. They're probably at 90, 95% of their maximum heart rate. And that's why you have to swap guys. At the end of these races, you'll see them swap two people out because their two primary grinders will literally be spent and that'll be all the racing they'll do for the day. Okay, Stan, enjoy, please, Ben. Wow. Okay, Wanna so go? 90 or 90, what happens if you go 100? <laughs> <laughs> I just don't want to know. Oh, I'm not sure we'll ever find out. It's so, a big lead, Ali. This is, uh, this is a very healthy lead, isn't it? Downwind for the final time. And uh, Sir Ben Ainsley steaming away from the Swedes. Nathan Outridge with probably an impossible task on his hands now. Another interesting kind of feature tactically with the Brits is that they, they continually allowed themselves to split. We saw when Japan was ahead of the Swedes in the earlier race that you know they were really kind of tacking, kind of trying to conventional match race against the other guy. Here we're seeing more of that multi-hull, more of the multi-hull match racing that we've seen in the past. Big splits go wall to wall, not really worried about covering the other guy and actually just kind of going from boundary to boundary on Land Rover BAR. Lay line in. Lay line in. Ten. Okay, Ben. Five. Happy. There you go. Happy. Happy. One word. That's happy. This is where all, all young sailors should grow up to be grinders or wing trimmers. I mean, I'm sorry, drivers or wing trimmers. <laughs> That's your goal of life. He's going low mode. I'll tell you that Artemis do not count these guys out. As always, they're, they're trying a low, slow mode, and they're not going very slow. Reach to finish. Reach to the finish. It's not going to be easy to pass. They're trying this low, slow mode to get around the mark, but they have gained on this leg considerably. On the nose, on grade. Yep, they've put themselves right back in the picture as they round the final gate. And the Brits in front. They should have enough from here, but the Swedes have made it really interesting. Joey, was that an obvious puff out on the water that kind of brought the Swedes down? No, I think what we saw there was the setup from the top mark. So Ben, um, instead of choosing to jive and cover, was just happy to spend a bit of his lead. He knew he was going to get around that reach mark in front. So he spent a bit of his lead, got around in front, and just took the safe option to the finish, rather than add more maneuvers and add a bit more complexity. Swedes in hot pursuit. Not a huge amount to choose between them in terms of the speed of the boat right now. But given what has to be described as a fair degree of negativity surrounding this British team, they have huge support here in Bermuda, of course, a big British presence. They do have huge support here, and this you can, you can hear the sighs of relief from all over the island of Bermuda right now from every supporter of this uh, British team. So the Swedes, brilliant in practice, and it was suggested they had a target on their back ahead of these races out here on the Great Sound, but Land Rover BAR, the British team, crossing in front for a first victory. Do not write the British off, do not write Ben Ainsley off. That is quite a turn up, and Nathan Outridge's Swedish team follow in behind some 11 seconds further back. We got a regatta on our hands. You know, we have multiple uh, multiple teams, very clearly have multiple teams that can uh, go the distance. Who can improve faster than the other guy? That's the, that's the big thing. And I'll tell you, Ben Ainsley's team has improved okay, very, very quickly in the last few days. So this is the, uh, the summary of the race itself and uh, Great Britain really dominating. But they, but they were dominating as the race went on. They're actually increasing their lead, increasing their lead the last uh, couple legs. I think it's exactly what Joey was saying. They just set themselves up for a couple conservative maneuvers, uh, tried to maybe even eliminate a maneuver, and, um, and all of a sudden they have a nice little comfortable win. Doesn't look, 10 seconds looks close, but, or 11 seconds looks close, but on the water is actually a fair distance. So two more races 
to happen this afternoon. What a beautiful day it is in Bermuda and Land Rover BAR will be delighted with the start that they have made. Terrific racing. And they've come firing out of the blocks, which they surely had to do. Competition red hot right from the outset, but to lay down that kind of marker, Ken, really important to this lot. He's not, he, so Giles, is in, he's not even breathing hard right now, which really kind of ticks <laughs> me off. <laughs> Let's have a word with Giles Scott. Giles, congratulations. That, that is quite a victory. Uh, you must be delighted with that. Very, very smooth maneuvering. What, what was key for you? Yeah, no, it was. We're, uh, you know, we're pretty stoked on board here at the minute. We've, um, you know, I think it's uh, it's been well documented that we've uh, been struggling in the in the practice racing, and to be able to come out on the first race when it actually counts and put a good race like that in against such a strong team such as Artemis is uh, is great for us. And it's uh, you know, and honestly, it's an awful lot of frustration that's that's come out of us boys on on board here today. And uh, it's just great that we're able to dig in there and, uh, and come out with. Uh, with a, with a victory over such a great race. Hey, hey, Giles, this is Ken Reed. Listen, have you, I'm assuming you've raced against Artemis plenty of times in these practice races. Is that is that the case? Uh, yeah, we have raced against Artemis and all the other boats quite a lot, yeah. yeah have you beat, is, yeah. had you beaten them to date? Um, yes, we have, once. Once about three months ago. Wow, so, so I'm sure you guys hear, you guys hear all the, the rumors and everything else. Is that something you've really felt within your team, or have you been able to shake it off? And I mean, obviously, just an incredible turn of events here. I, I, first of all, congratulations. But is this like whew, breath of fresh air? This is we, we get to kind of is this a restart? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm str actually struggling to hear you, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's I, I'm sure it's a surprise for a lot of people, but you know, it's, it's no surprise to anyone in our team because. Everyone on, you know, as part of Land Rover BAI has been busting a gut over the past, well, the past three years and especially the past four months. So uh, it's nice to be able to to give the uh, give the shore crew, the designers, and all the guys uh, back in Canberra something to something to get them going because it's certainly got us going. Giles, many congratulations. Enjoy your victory. Yeah, thank you. Hopefully, there's some more to come. So they'll be hoping there is more to come. This is how it all unfolded. Ken. Yeah, Ainsley did a nice job of getting that low line, that that kind of that lay line. Good timing, but you know this is where we started saying, "Wow, these guys are quick." They they actually had a little pace on Artemis, which was always rumored to be fast going into this first mark. Not only are they on the inside, but they were a little quicker on that leg as well. And then they extend, and then they keep extending. And of course, it's just kind of. It's just kind of low-key, typical Ben Ainsley. You know, we know he's this, well, you called, you called Spithill a pit bull earlier. I, I would maintain this guy is the ultimate pit, uh, pit bull in the water, but they just look calm, cool, collected. What, what rumors? There's no rumors of being a slow boat out here. We're quick, and let's just prove it. Let's go beat one of the front runners. So very, very impressive race by uh, by the Brits, and the, and the whole entire BAR team must be breathing huge sighs of relief. So a wonderful day and a great start to the America's Cup Louis Vuitton qualifiers. Great racing for everybody to witness here and a brilliant day out for all these spectators. We have managed to complete four races.
in the opening race of the day. And the New Zealanders also seeing off the French in race number three. So the, uh, the briefest of pauses, New Zealand's Peter Burling, keen to take on the favourites early. Oh, it's great to be helping to defend early on and, and just check in and see where we're at. Uh, obviously, you know, we've been based in NZ, kind of a long way away from here for a long time, and come up here, we're really happy with how we're going, but it's you know, good, to, good to see it in anger and you know, we're, we're, we're cool we're ready. Pedal power is amongst us. This is something we're all going to have to get used to. We actually have some absolute non-sailors that are on this team that are just there for pure power. And that is something that, that the sport of sailing has never really seen before. But then you have the style of Glenn Ashby and, uh, and Peter Burling, who just doesn't seem to ever lose. And pretty strong team. Looking very good in their opening race, that's for sure. Jimmy Spithills USA facing them. The repeat of the 2013 America's Cup match. A rivalry everybody enjoys. No holds barred between these two. No, nah, look, I mean, I think both teams are going out there, you know, with the gloves off, ready to go. And, you know, I think it's just such an incredible learning process for everyone, you know, these, these double qualifiers. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see, you know, if everyone's... Got some different ideas on the setups of their boats already, we're seeing with the appendages. But uh, hey, forecast looks great, so it should be a fun race. The America's Cup and the Louis Vuitton world has been waiting for this rematch for a long, long time. The, for sure, everybody coming here is just making the assumption that Oracle Team USA is going to be strong. They're well funded, they've been here for longer than anybody else, they have more time on board foiling boats. But What's going to happen? Like they said, the gloves are off. Let's let's get these two heavyweights and let them battle. So there's the entry box, and uh, we are preparing for race number five here on the Great Sound. New Zealand against the USA. Peter Burling against Jimmy Spithill. And uh, as with all of these teams today, very little time to recover from their first outing. And a lot of them are switching uh, people around. They're, you're never going to see the afterguard or this, the new, what we call the new afterguard, the wing trimmer and the driver ever change unless somebody gets sick or injured for, for the most part. You're never going to see these two guys change, uh, that's for sure. But uh, the grinders up front, like Joey told us earlier, most teams are changing out one or two grinders per, per race on these multiple race days, two race days. And that's just purely for more power. they got to power these hydraulic systems. So the picture is setting, but there is a real fight going on out there on the water between all of these crews and the, the USA eager to stamp their authority on proceedings. Very well timed. Remember the poor tack boater, the New Zealanders get 10 second advantage coming across. Actually, uh, the Americans look to be quite late uh, coming into the starting line box. We'll have to see if that becomes a problem or not for them. Joey, when you're uh, when you're on board the boat right now at this stage and you're the and you're on board with your boys on Oracle. What are you thinking? Is it, is it an advantage or disadvantage, do you think, coming in from the starboard side, uh, the way they're coming in in this race? Yep. It's, a, it's a definite disadvantage, can to be on starboard entry, um, like we just saw of uh, USA. When you're the Kiwi boat, you can come in from the, um, the port side, you go in, you do one manoeuvre, and now they're pretty much set up for their start. They just choose their timing. Whereas when you're the USA boat, you have to be a little more careful about what the other boat's doing. So Jimmy right now is being influenced by what the Kiwis have done. And you're not really on your own path. So the tactics, as ever, absolutely key. Cat and mouse and everybody trying to outmaneuver the other. And again, there's that ley line. There's the line that Burling is kind of trying to get down to to make sure that Jimmy doesn't try to hook him. That, remember, hook would be Jimmy going around the other side. But what he wants to do is Jimmy right now is gapped off. He's trying to get up in that position. It's worked in a couple of the starts. It hasn't worked in a couple of the starts. Let's see if he bears down and goes back at him again. Goes down and try to try to push him a little bit closer to the line and a little closer to that lay line. 
They're talking about he's going to be close. That means he's, he's on a narrow lay line going into that mark. So it's going to be hard for Burling to get a lot of speed coming into the mark. Jimmy wants to try to gap off if he can to be able to slingshot around him. Looks to be gauging it pretty well at the moment. Jimmy Spithill, Oracle Team USA. On the side, the Kiwis drag race crossing pretty much in a straight line. Burling did a really nice job of fending that off. I thought he was going to be slower and a little tighter coming into that mark. Can USA use their wing wash? Can they use their disturbed air and get over the top and slow down New Zealand? They look it's just an unbelievable sight of the cyclist right there. He's inside, he's on an inside overlap, but is he going to be able to hold off? He, the overlap is now broken, so Spithill should be able to go around in front of him and lead after mark one. At the first mark then, the Americans are leading the way, just edging out the Kiwis, but really nothing to choose between them at this point. Huge crowds on the shore. Okay, I'm going to call it. Keep coming. Hundreds, Keep thousands more down, even. Please. Littered across the sound in boats of their own. Okay, happy. Three. Numbers Two. are good. Numbers are good. One. Two giants of the racing world, the sailing world, going head to head. I mean, two perfect jibes right there. I don't think there was uh, an inch loss, gain or loss between the two of them. This is really a check-in race. This is what, what the sailors would call a check-in race. This is, let's see where we stand against some of the other big boys. Left turn, left turn. So far, it's not letting us down. Good, good mode, boys. Making game. an eagle. Eagle. Eagle in three. Here's the uh, eagle, eagle again. Eagle. We, we're going to have to, well, let's wait till they get around this mark, this gate, and we'll have to ask Joey, what the heck is an eagle? So to the gate, round the gate, not the smoothest of operations from the Americans, and the Kiwis looking to make the gain on the inside. That you're exactly right, and I'm very surprised the Kiwis did a really nice job there. I'm surprised they didn't split for the other gate, but they chose to just simply try to have a better mark round and get to the inside like they did, and Oracle's in a tough spot right now. Now, Oracle gets protection on this boundary. So as yep. soon as Oracle goes into within three boat lengths of the boundary, they, so actually New Zealand gets out of there. They don't even wait for that protection to happen. Uh, good tactical decisions on both boats at this stage. But yes, that mark rounding, very well done by Emirates to New Zealand. So Peter Burling just looking to dictate terms out here and uh, Avoid getting into any kind of scramble or scrap around the boundary mark. Or Happy 24, 25. In very close no, proximity. No There's no almost a meter in between it. So, you know, when are we going to get a close race? Joey, what's an eagle? We keep hearing about an eagle coming into that lured yeah, gate. Tell us what an eagle is. So I need to know if uh, it's a little bit proprietary, Ken, but I'll... <laughs> <laughs> an eagle is just a maneuver that we use okay. coming into the bottom, mate. Bottom marks, we got a but, um, patch coming here and we haven't seconds. quite got the ley lines correct, so um, it's just a different move that we do using all the foils that, the um, that helps us get Light around the bottom marks in good better gap. shape. I'm um, not really like that one you just saw okay, there. I'm sure by. the boys are pretty upset with that bottom mark around here. Happy. Three, two, Keeping his clubs close to his chest, Ken. We're going to have to do better than that. We're going to get him fired by just dragging out as much information as we possibly can. <laughs> Not the best tack by the Americans right there. Let's see if these guys can do a little smoother tack. This is a, this is a full on slug fest. There's literally zero in it right now. Zero. In two boats that have spent the last several years designing foil, how to trim the foil above the deck and, and to trim the foils below the deck. In, in their own isolated areas, and here they are within a tenth of a knot of each other. I mean, they're right, they're right next to each other. It's incredible. How much are they racing their own race right now, Ken? How much is is Peter Burling eyeballing 
Jimmy Spithill and vice versa. Well, first of all, he's not going slow right now. There's a little left hand uh, wind shift out on the race course right now, and all of a sudden, uh, Team New Zealand has a little better pressure and a better angle, left hand angle. We can see this from our booth and see it on the on the race tracker. So it's a. Uh, this is all about boat speed right now and now positioning. All of a sudden we're going to see a pass. Emirates Team New Zealand, do they tack and try to put their wing wash on top of Oracle Team USA or do they give them a little space and use the boundary? And they go boundary. So maybe a little more traditional multi-hull uh, racing using the boundaries as wide as they can. They're thinking of the of, of going up the track. Maybe they can minimize attack uh, as they go up the track. They're not going slow. Coming into a good gas. Really tracking each other. Good gas there, maneuver just working for it up. Maneuver, meter for meter. If the Kiwis can make it through this gate without having to tack one more time, then the ability to not tack on Oracle back there, back behind where we were 30, 40 seconds ago, not tacking on them will save them a tack and save them a huge amount of distance. So this is, this could potentially be very well set up by the Kiwis. And gee, Burling looks really stressed there, doesn't he? I mean, he's gonna, he's gonna fall asleep if, if, if he gets any more relaxed. There will be a split at the top, though. If Burling makes the gate, Oracle will be splitting to the other side. No respite for the grinders. Always on point. And they made that mark. They made that gate. It's a really nice tactical move by New Zealand to use the boundary and not actually tack on top of Oracle. Like you asked earlier, they're actually, they sailed their own boat there. They used the geometry of the race course and, uh, and gained considerably by doing it. So the Americans around gate three are trailing now and they will crank up the speed once more. Hold the sheet. We're gonna do it. You can hear the okay. Right here, I've got no software. Okay, no. Copy. Okay. Again, very puffy out there, Stand Joey. By. Is, there, the is there any sort of breeze that, that you can see to make this a little bit of closer race? Um, it, it is puffy, Ken. I, I think what you'll see is Oracle come back on a pretty nice shift now, but you know, up that beat, the Kiwi sailed incredibly well. Oracle, I think, had mostly bad tacks. The Kiwis had mostly good ones, and that's exactly the difference that you're seeing here is in the maneuvers. I would say I always love New Zealand fans, except that kid was wearing a Yankees hat, and that's not that's not good in my book as a Red Sox fan. He's confused. <laughs> so this gap, a pretty healthy one at the moment for the Kiwis. But just that one little thing to, took into a huge lead. Yeah, coming up. Good gas coming here. The legs working as fast as the arms. Cyclones. Cyclones. And weight distribution is key as well, isn't it, Ken? You know, that they can't be dancing around on the platform for too long. They have to whiz from one place to the next in a great hurry just to make sure that the distribution is right. They're ripping right there right now. A little, a little breezier out on the race course all the way around. and just screaming into this gate. Pushing up towards the 40 knot mark and the Kiwis are going at full throttle and barely, barely breaking it all as they round the gate and off they go already, picking up speed again. But Oracle has a split again. 
against they have, they have to do something at this stage they're pretty far behind so they're going to have to try to split and find something find a little good luck charm off on the right hand side of the race course where they're headed Well, isn't it with the, the smoothness of the maneuvers we, we think back to to some of those that haven't been yep. quite so well ordered quite so well composed the amount of time you lose just one error can cost you big time in this foiling world there is no doubt that those little mistakes are completely exaggerated now here's oracle got their split i mean they look at that they've taken three quarters of Team New Zealand's lead out just by getting that split at the lured gate. So that's that's exactly what you want to do if you're the boat behind and all of a sudden they've taken 300 meters down to 100 meters it's seemingly in no time. Jimmy Spithill bringing his team back into contention. The other the other part of this and they still have a, a split force. So so Emirates Team New Zealand had a big decision to make right there. Do they tack and, and again that conventional map tracing uh, strategy of actually trying to use their bad air or do they use the gate? Oracle has now forced the split in two different ways at the bottom gate and here we are a quarter of the way up the beat. So this is this is a textbook how you try to get back into a race. You need a little bit of luck but at the same time textbook on how you position yourself to get back into the race. Well they are gaining all the time and they've done a fabulous job. So resilient. Stand by. So Joey for the for those of us sitting here trying to figure this whole new world out. Wind shift or boat speed or a little of both. What do you think? I, I honestly can. I think we're seeing the difference in maneuvers. At, at the bottom mark there, Oracle did a nice job of getting a split, like you were saying. So um, then we saw a little bit in wind shift. But the rest of this race, I think we're seeing in Team New Zealand just tacking really, really well. Um, hopefully, Oracle will get a little bit of a left shift here and come into them a little bit closer. Well, hopefully for me. But um, I, this race seems to be tightening up a little bit. Yeah, keep this a little bit rumbling. So the Americans out in force on the shoreline. Good and puppy. Still in the mix Good here. A couple of legs left in this. They will believe, they will feel they very much have the beating of the Kiwis at this point. Still yeah. within their compass. Again, they have the split. That is the key for, for the Americans at this stage. They do have a split. It's a narrow racetrack, don't get me wrong. It, it, it's not a huge split. It's not like the old days where you couldn't see somebody on the horizon. They were so far on the other side of the course. They've been struggling with their tax during this whole race, as Joey pointed out earlier. No lower, no lower. Copy. Big trip, boys. Big trip. Nice tack. That was a pretty good tack right there. But, Big one up. but I would say Precious several of the tacks during this race for the Americans, they will not be happy with. And here they are right back in the hunt. Looks like a right shift on the far side of the course. They had a good tack. Okay. And here nice they are lower. right back in the game. Wow. Big one, big one. Both boats are likely going to have to tack at least one more time before the gate. Pressure's all on the inside, I think. Right Bruce on the Spidhill edge of it. Saying pressure on the Hi, inside. Yeah, Can Team New Zealand make that gate mark, or are they going to have to tack one more time? Up. Okay. Keep coming. Oracle pressing We're hard go to get to up to their side of the gate. This is going to be a we got very we close do. rounding. Overlap by Oracle means they would have the ability to get We're around the mark inside of Emirates Team New Zealand. Ready to flag? They have an overlap. Hey, hey. Right turn. Okay, let's back again, again. Oh, bye. Very, very tight. Okay. They're heading for a, a collision luff. course. A second luff. A collision. Try to hook up. Good hook up here. Protest from the Americans. A luff and a second luff. They had the ability. They were inside. They were lured boats. They had an overlap coming into it. Stand by. All good on pitch. No penalty. I'm off a little, Kato. Richard Slater, okay. the chief Happy. umpire. Three, two, one. Chief umpire should be awfully generous today. There's the first luff. Okay, let's back again. Spittle comes back oh, down. Bye. Team New Zealand comes go, go. down. Second luff. They decided that Emirates Team New Zealand did enough to get out of the way. 
Luff one, Luff two, no contact, which is the key. No contact, so that means there can be a green flag. But it is game on. It is absolutely game on at the moment. The, the turn of events in a couple of these races amongst the guys who are very fast is incredible. Got him not but it's two drives. Coming off of their foil there. David. Unforced error. Here early. Well, it may cost them because the USA it's picking up really, really good speed at the, the moment. Yeah. Comfortably Game faster. And beginning to stretch away to the Come final on, gate before they Go. reach Go. to the finish. Three, what a two, turnaround in one. fortunes for Jimmy Spithill. Had to gamble. Had to go hunting for pressure, yeah, hunting for breeze. Okay. But it has Keep paid coming. off in spades. The split, the seconds. constant splits that Stand Oracle by. forced by getting the split at that at the, a long time ago at the Lured Gate really one. gave them ability to catch a break there, to actually do the geometry correct and to get around to that to last do. gate with one fewer attack than Emirates Team New Zealand. Big support for the Kiwis, but it is Turning the up. Americans who are around the final gate now, in front. The New Zealand is keeping it really, really tight. Yeah. Looking to We're keep those distances keep down. Coming. Interesting by both boats, not perfect by both boats. Oracle took that, uh, USA took that very wide, and the Kiwis were a little understood, really low on pitch. Oh, sorry, overstood, and they, they actually had to slow down to get around it. Both boats got around okay, but it wasn't, again, definitely some uh, room for the coaches to go in and critique at the end of the day. It's noisy out there. 40 knots for both boats. The Americans have enough to hold out here. Looks like they do, but they will not rest until that finish line is crossed. He's looking to gain brilliant finish. 118 meters between the two boats right now. Which when you see it in person, it doesn't seem like that much. Well, it's a wonderful sight. Two passes in this race, Ali. And if this is uh, this is what is yet to come, we are in for a real treat here in Great Sound of Bermuda. Looks like the Americans will hold out here. The defenders of the Americas Cup coming through in fine style in the end. Victory over the French in the opening race of the day and victory over their old rivals, the Kiwis, in race number five. It was a fascinating battle. Two of the big dogs going at it and two vital passes. So much intrigue and tactical savvy. It's gone the way of the Americans. You going to do a uh, TV interview, Jimmy? Yeah. Can we just do a, uh... So hopefully we'll be able to mic up Jimmy Spithill and have a word with him very shortly, but he will be well pleased with his day's work. Goodness, what a race that was. Yeah, per I mean, that, that's exactly what...
the defenders off to a flyer. So, Sir Ben Ainsley and Dean Barker locking horns shortly. Japanese taken out by a narrow margin by the Swedes in their opening contest. Great Britain having the better also of Nathan Outridge's Swedish team in their first race too. So we are setting up nicely for the final race of the day on a, a glorious day on the Great Sound in Bermuda. Just a fantastic America's Cup village here. For those who are planning to come to Bermuda to watch some of this racing, it's an amazing setup out here at the dockyard. Uh, as you can see, the picturesque sound, the color of the water, the whole atmosphere. Uh, there, there's not much not to like out here, especially when the racing is as tight as, and, and as exciting as, as we've seen so far. So the British crew just preparing. And uh, Larry Ellison, a happy man. Part of the uh, the Oracle outfit, more than just a part. Yeah, more he than just the, a part. He is the part. He likes to win. <laughs> Let's put it that way. He likes to win. Well, there should be smiles on their faces for sure. Land Rover BAR gearing up for their final challenge. from overhead, the Bermuda Dockyard. First victory, Barker, who disputes the notion that many of the British seem to hold that facing them because of this collaboration on the design is roughly the same as facing the USA. Yeah, well, I don't think I've got the same twang as Jimmy, so uh, I think it's probably one, one big difference. But, um, um, yeah, other than that, uh, you know, there's just another team. So, you know, we've got to go out and race in as well as we possibly can. We're seeing a little bit more wind and we're seeing it move a little bit further to the right and I, I think that's what we've seen in the previous races. The boats who have gone to the right upwind have been gaining. So I look to see both these skippers try and get their boats on the right hand side of the race course heading upwind. 
Excellent. Thank you for the updates. 13 knots of breeze out there right now, Ali, with peaks to 15.8 according to our instrumentation. So that's that's by far the most amount of uh, breeze that we've seen out in the race course today. So Ben Aisley against Dean Barker. What a feather in the cap it would be for the British team if they could come away with two victories today after so many people were suggesting their boat perhaps wasn't quite up to it. Ken, I mean, if they could I, register read, victories against the Swedes and the Japanese I, in one day, that would be some day. I've read articles completely writing them off. And to write off Sir Ben is a pretty silly notion in, in, in my book. So, but I, but I have to admit, at the same time, it is a bit of a, it, it's also a bit of a surprise. I mean, it, I watched some of their practice racing, and they were off the pace. And what have they done? Let, let, I mean, that's the big one. Let, let's figure out what have they done in order to uh, get back up to speed uh, in such a short period of time. But that's what this thing is about. It's about evolving, daily evolution of your entire package. And obviously, they've done something very well. So a great start to build upon. But consistency is always key. Okay, no problem. One off. Not a hot man used to anybody. Entry the box right on time to start with his entry box. Ten seconds ahead. As Joey was telling us earlier, the port tack boat really gets to kind of pick their line. Uh, where they want to. So let's see if uh, Ben takes advantage of that. But he's up against, obviously, an incredibly good match racer in Deep Park. We would lay line 140 low. Quite a variety of heights that we're seeing when they're up on the floors, Ken, as well. I mean, just talk us through the uh, the difference in, in how they're supposed to manage that height and what it can do for them. Yeah, it's, it's not easy. I mean, it, they're making it look so easy, this consistent ride height. If any of us mere mortals got out there and tried to do it, we would be all over the lot. It's just, it's soft. It's software in the system. It's how to use the system. Here's Ainsley jiving around. Again, right down on that ley line. Below the ley line, he's gearing up to try to lead back from the, from the lured position. So the British flying their hulls and involved in this cat and mouse procedure as we prepare to get these last two boats over the line for the final race of the day here on the Great Sound in Bermuda. So G GBR is way down low in the box. They're really tight up to that mark, leading up to that mark right now. Let's see if Dean Barker goes after him or if he tries to keep a gap between. He doesn't seem to think he's too tight on the ley line, so he's going for a hook and he's coming in high. He is going at one point looking like he was heading straight for And he them. gets him. He gets right around the inside. Oh, there's a collision, a big collision between the two boats. So this is going to be very interesting. No doubt the protest will be lodged probably by the Japanese. Protest for room there, Ben. What will be the outcome of that? And more to the point, will there be any damage done? Well, there's for sure carbon fiber skins. There's going to be damage done. Fortunately, I don't think anybody's got hurt there because that was a lot of people. It looks like both boats are stopping. So there must be damage. Penalty against GBR. So they didn't think, well, obviously, we, as we were talking about, they came in hot on board Japan. They did a luff in what the umpires are saying is that GBR did not do enough to get out of the way of the Japanese. Technically, they're still racing right now. The whole world is doing exactly what these people are doing and holding their breath. Hands together in prayer for the British supporters, but the penalty has gone against Sir Ben Ainsley. So what's happening right now is the penalty ha after the starting line, the penalty is two boat lengths behind Japan. So Japan will essentially can wait and stop. GBR has to follow two boat lengths behind, and there it is. There's the, 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 so that's actually kind of an interesting new phenomenon in the modern, 
the boat ahead could just stop because the penalty means you have to be at least two boat lengths behind once this thing all starts. Okay, well, obviously, there's not damage on board the boats enough to have them prevent them from sailing right now, but wow. Big, big collision and uh, a big event at the start of this final race, and it's allowed the Japanese to get off to a flyer. The hulls coming together in no uncertain terms, but Sir Ben Ainsley on the back foot from the outset as they reach Mark 1. Taking a bit of a dive as well. Let's hope that there isn't a lot. You know, it's really one of the fears of these, of these teams is having enough damage that you kind of, I mean, coming in hot. SoftBank comes in, they hold their line, they hold their line, they're not luffing hard, they're not luffing hard. Easy just to get out of the way. He has to respond there. He has to react. And I don't, th I think the umpires made exactly the right call. Japan hold their line, hold their line, slowly come up, bang! He's got it. I mean, Ainsley, in essence, has to almost tack there. He has to get out of the way. Well, this is, this is something else, and you've got to fear for those guys, the grinders who were uh, taking the full brunt of the hull. Let's have a word with Richard Slater, the chief umpire. Uh, Richard, explain this to us for, uh, for, um, for everybody watching. Yeah, just wait one. Going okay, in. guys, thinking damage. Hey, start thinking damage process of GBR. We're happy that they caused it, right? So it's not... Yeah, this is the chief umpire. Um, we we judged that incident was that once Japan got an overlap with Land Rover BAR, BAR did not respond in time, and that's why we peddled them. There you go. There's the explanation. That's going to be a great feature for us uh, throughout this series, Ali, is, is being able to talk to Richard and getting his exact opinion. Some Certainly some concerned shore team members for both of these boats right now because it is one of the fears of any program. You have enough damage, you can get wiped out of a couple days and all of a sudden you're in trouble. Numbers, come on. Head it, boys, head it. So a dramatic start to the final race of the day here. And the British have it all to do. I'm looking desperately to try to find some damage. If there were damage, it would be right back in this area there. And I'm just not so sure we see much, which is a really good... Oh, there's some damage on the water line, I think, right in here. There's something right there. Um, yeah, there's a little bit of carbon fiber right there, so the skins are broken. It looks like there might even be a crack right in this area, right there. So there is some damage to the boat. There, if there's skin damage, that means that there's water getting inside of that skin. It's not going to be easy to repair. So the boys in the sheds are going to be busy tonight. Holy mackerel. And glue has to dry. It's not like you just wave a magic wand and this stuff fixes itself. This is why these teams have the best boat builders on the planet to, for exact situations yeah, just like this. There it is. Yeah, that is a better shot of That's it. That's a good chunk. It right there, like folks. A, That's a good chunk. It's like a shot bite. Yeah, it's a shark bite. It's a, it's a Barker bite. Close race, though, going on. Let's Now we get back. Oh, by the way, there's a race happening. Yeah. <laughs> One as well, or it's one that's getting tighter. And Barker is, is actually holding a very similar strategy to what he had in that first race against Artemis, a race he inevitably he eventually lost, but tight cover, more kind of conventional match racing, tight cover. Uh, here he is essentially right on top of Land Rover BAR and trying to use the wing wash or the disturbed air off of his wing to slow down the boots. You talked about hand to hand combat. Can. We've seen hull to hull combat. And it won't be the last time over the America's Cup weeks that we see it, I'm sure. It will not be the last time. Common denominator so far, we had we had a pretty serious collision in, in the practice racing, and it was again Land Rover BAR uh, actually taking a little bite out of Emirates Team New Zealand. So Ainsley 
it, they say in NASCAR, if you're not rubbing, you're not racing, right? So, so I think uh, Ainsley must might be driving NASCAR cars in his spare time. On board the British boat. Lay line is 40 away. Look at steely determination from the helmsman. And all these guys, meters. I think, preparing, preparing yeah. for <laughs> their, their running, long, long night. They're running for the glue. <laughs> only 100 meters in this alley, and uh, we've seen we've seen far bigger leads than that actually evaporate in no time so far today. Day number one. So the owners firmly on the Japanese and Dean Barker to make that penalty count to try to see it through all the way. Heading up towards gate three. Now what advantage is, uh, as far as the fairing of these hulls and that damage uh, on board uh, the, the Brits boat is the hull's out of the water most of the time. So they need to get it solid. They need it to get it in one piece. They need to get it dry. And the actual fairing part of it may not be the biggest critical part of the, of, of the repair. We'll see if... Uh, on the starboard side of the boat, maybe at some stage we'll be able to see if we see any damage on board the, the Japanese craft. Japanese round gate three, followed by the British team. Downwind they go. See the flapping back there. You see flapping. Okay, happy to go something. here. Yeah, that doesn't look too healthy. You see this flapping down in this area here. It's yeah, like a, hold up. It's like they caught an octopus okay, or something. Going before the next light patch. <laughs> uh, it's carbon. It's just carbon layers of carbon fiber. I think actually peeling off. But um, on a platform that is all about the aerodynamics yeah. and reducing drag, any of that is a fairly sizable negative. Two hundred meters between it. It's, uh, if we've got it. Certainly not insurmountable. What, what's Don't really impressive it. here, obviously, with professional teams like this, is how they should, both teams have shaken it off and they're ripping around the race course after you know, what appears to be a reasonably serious it, collision in the pre-start. So I would say that's part and parcel for yeah, guys like this. They're 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 almost oh, immune to the pressure awesome, and they just kind of okay, little bump, send it, off we go. And they're so skilled, aren't they? I mean it goes without saying that they will be able to do something to patch that yeah, up in time for tomorrow, you would have thought if it's not preventing them overly from doing what they need to do today, then if they have to work through the night, they will do that. They will be back on the water tomorrow. Uh, if there's anything that's 100% in this life, besides death and taxes, is that they will be working through the night to put that back together. That is an absolute guarantee. So the lead for SoftBank Team Japan, around about 150 meters or so, heading for gate four. Yep, and let's make sure, you know, from a ley line standpoint, get them down into the gate. They certainly don't want to have to make another maneuver as they're coming toward the gate, but it looks like they have it split pretty well. The next question will be, does Ainsley try to do a last minute maneuver and split off the course the way Oracle did in that last race? And it certainly allowed them plenty of opportunity to get back in the race, of which they finally got back and passed the Cubans. So there's a close-up of the damage. Yeah. That's just peeling layers of carbon fiber right there. So obviously there's a bit of a crack in the hull, and those layers are kind of peeling, unsticking from each other, creating a little telltale along the side of the, of the hull. Ainsley decides to follow around Ali and not do the split. That's an interesting call. What, what's, uh, what are the, the dice he can roll at this point? Well, I, you know, obviously it was a ley line going into that last gate that, yeah, that he please. didn't think they had enough room to pull off that last second jive and go around the other mark. So he's going to have to try to grind him down in another form of fashion, the old-fashioned way. So the Japanese stretching away. 
beginning to build on their lead now, picking up per good speed, 26, 27 knots. Pretty good lead, very controlling position Sorry, boys. for Japan right now, with uh, essentially with the Brits dead on their heels, 200 meters behind. It would have to be a pretty big wind shift or a reasonably large mistake, but we've seen them so far today. We've seen, we have certainly seen situations that have been surprising with regard to teams coming from well behind. Just weapons, aren't they? Machines. Flying machines. Get around this side of the hull and see if there's any damage to that starboard side of, of the Japanese boat. Happy, mate. As we zoom in here a little bit, you have better eyes than I do. We're not going to see it on that. <laughs> the Brits aren't going slow. They're, they're staying about 220 behind. They haven't really lost. Much distance. Oh, go, keep, we're going to get past him, I think, here. But for all the drama and the excitement of that collision, Ken, those those grinders in the Japanese boat, I mean, they were, they were in serious peril at that point. Yeah, that was close. I mean, with the boats that high out of the water, that, that, that you know, you could easily see one hull getting under another hull. I, that's, I mean, talk about well, a really good example as to quite why everybody's wearing helmets for starters. Fair point. Fair point. Lots of safety measures all over these guys, mandated by the rules. Uh, they, it, you know, they, it, for all the right reasons, obviously. So the gap beginning to stretch beyond the 300 meter mark now for the Japanese. And not a whole lot of the course left for the British to do something meaningful about it. Isn't it always the case where when you're ahead, everything's more settled, you look smoother, you look better. <laughs> it's... Like you said earlier in the broadcast, the Japanese are accredited to be the first team to do a foiling tack, and now it's simply commonplace. It's look on regulation, hasn't it? And yeah. I just wonder as well, Ken, we, we talked uh, already today about some of the crews that have been out here for some time in Bermuda, the, the Swedes, obviously, the, uh, the Americans, the Japanese. Just, just how much of an edge do you think that might have given those three being out here for, for this length of time already? Well, uh, yeah, it, it's easy to say, it's certainly easy to say that being here has to be good, but... Are you, are you saying you're betting against the Kiwis at this stage? Not at all. Yeah. I just wonder how much time on the water, local conditions, local knowledge, and just being settled in one place, being able to get all their ducks in a row, so to speak, in, in that kind of time span. Well, sailors are pretty adaptable. They're a pretty adaptable lot. And by the way, not just sailors, but sailors' families are an incredibly adaptable lot. And uh, I don't think it's as much that part. I think these, I think, uh, for example, in the, in the Kiwis example, they could find plenty of flat water training uh, in the Auckland area to go out and, and try to learn. Water's water. But the nuances of an area, just the comfort level in an area, is certainly something to be said for that. Surely no way back for the British crew at this point. The Japanese beginning to recognize that their work is done in this race. They will register their first here. victory of the day under Dean Barker and Sabana Easley. Well, there is plenty to attend to. Amazing, isn't it, how sport has that ability to bring you crashing back down to earth. In this case, quite literally, just a, 
a handful of moments ago they were celebrating a really fine Super win over the Swedes. <laughs> exactly. And now their boats in all kinds of different well, bits. Well, so what will be interesting here, I mean, the, obviously the second half of this race, and Joey, Joey Newton's out on the race course, the second half of this race, all of a sudden the Brits have felt well off the pace. Yeah. What do you th is there any potential that there's any damage to their do they show any signs that their board system or rudder system might have some damage to it joey i can't see anything like that ken um i did see i think their hull might be completely hulled i did see water pouring out of that damage at one point so maybe the hull's getting slowly heavier which would actually help them on one tack but it'd make them a lot slower on the other so maybe that's what we're seeing here is they're just trying to nurse it around the track get it back into the boat builders and get it ready to fight another day 42 knots, the highest speed I think we've seen coming in on this finish reach, this high-powered blast reach to the finish, kind of the, the new show put on for the modern-day America's Cup, and what a show it is. As these, as these boats come ripping across the finish line and very quickly literally plug their bows and whitewash the crew in order to stop in time before they end up in a in the grandstand front row lap. These guys are so nice racing. Couldn't have started out much more bizarrely than it did. Six races today, Ali. Are you winded? Are you as winded as these grinders? <laughs> I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> they have put in a serious shift today, all of these guys. Two races in the day. They've been putting their best foot forward. And SoftBank Team Japan with Dean Barker at the helm, cruising quietly, calmly through the finish line for their first victory of the day, well earned. And a dramatic race, an extraordinary race. How's the injury factor? Which uh, okay, began with all kinds of trouble at the outset. And, uh, well, it's possible we have an injury on board the Japanese boat. That's uh, what Dean Barker was suggesting. Well, I think. I think what he was saying is, how, how about the injury factor there? It's exactly what we were talking about earlier. I mean, that, that the, the boats at, at different levels, high and low, out of the water on the foils, certainly sets them up for, for quite a bad injury. So the British with the carbon fiber peeling off their boat, eventually plunging their way through the finish line and their work is done for the day, but there is plenty for the offshore team to deal with overnight. Damage to the boat, one victory, an excellent one over the Swedes and one defeat yeah. to the Japanese. It's either, yeah. it's either that or stay very slow then. Okay. So here the summary of the race and uh, no talk of Great Britain in any one of those legs. Yeah, well, for sure, the, the Brits were, the Brits kept it very close through the first four legs and all of a sudden a, a big split, a big breakout by the Japanese. We hope it's not because of the British boat having more damage than we can actually see. We hope it was a wind shift or something like that. They were consistent at least the last three legs. So this was the early penalty, and it was a very dramatic one. Coming in with pace. Going around, SoftBank Team Japan is does have rights here. Ainsley just didn't turn the boat up. In fact, they popped up out of the water a little more and kind of landed on top. But look at the speed that that hook happened. Came in, overlap, overlap. Our head, our head umpire said, oh, the, the, um, the way that Ainsley's hull came out of the water and almost landed on top. Watch the guys and how close they are. Watch the, watch. Holy mackerel, get out of the way. Goodness gracious me. Well, you really do have to have every single attribute as a top-level sailor, and bravery is one of the key ones. So, confirmation of all the results of the round robin races today. The USA with two victories to their name in race one and race five. The Swedes on the board, the Kiwis, the British, and the Japanese. So, the French empty-handed after day one, Ken. 
Well, what, what, what did we learn today? The, you know, first of all, we learned that no lead is safe, that that when you're sailing against teams that are as polished as the especially the top four teams appear to be, uh, the, the, no lead is safe. And then you could come back from quite a distance. So here are the uh, the current standings. And of course, this might be a little confusing on the grounds that Great Britain took two extra points into the Louis Vuitton America's Cup uh, qualifiers thanks to their victory in the World Series through the course of the event. So add just one to their tally today. They're up to three. USA took one point forwards because they were runners up in the World Series. So they, with their two wins today, are also on three points. Sweden, New Zealand and Japan all with one and the French with nothing. So the damage, not just to the British boat, anxious moments for those on board SoftBank Team Japan as well. They look to have escaped by and large, without too much serious damage, can very difficult to tell from here, of course, but early indications suggest, uh, suggest really that the British have come off much the worse. Well, I, I'd be very surprised if these guys haven't crushed some of the core inside in between these carbon fiber uh, uh, layers, these skins. The, the, for sure, they'll be in, they'll do, they'll call, tap, they'll be tapping, tapping out each of the, each of the, uh, each of the hulls and making sure there's no delamination in all kinds of different spots on, on board the boat. These guys, for sure, we know we know for sure these guys have a long night ahead of them. We could actually see the damage. Well, it is very much a team event, isn't it, Ken? It is not just about the sailors no. out there on the water. It is all about everybody back on the shore who's going to have to put their heads together and get things straightened out ahead of day two the clock against them yeah there's no i don't think there's any redress if the penalty is caused by you so they can't say now let's say for example uh ben Ainsley racing was not penalized there they actually could ask for redress and get time to fix their boat but i believe because the penalty was uh, against them, they cannot ask for a delay. So let's have a word with uh, with Chris Draper, part of the uh, SoftBank Team Japan crew. Uh, Chris, what a dramatic race. Um, congratulations on your victory. Uh, first things first, is there any damage either to any of your sailors or to your boat? Um, I think, yeah, there's a couple of bruises um, and there's a little bit of compression damage to the hull and a little bit of damage to the fairing on the starboard side. We, at first we were concerned it was the beam, but um, it looks like it's just the fairing, so that's all good. But um, yeah, it was quite a surprise there. It was um, obviously pretty dramatic start to that race. It could have been pretty ugly, that. It was, um, it was a shame that that was the way the race started. So, hey, Chris, this is Ken Reed. Um, first of all, congratulations. Secondly, my goodness, did that look scary. It looked like a hull was coming down on top of all you guys. His, his lured hull kind of popped up out of the water there and he skidded sideways. That's what it looked like to me. Yeah, I mean, for, for, from, my, from my point of view, it, it kind of, it looked like they were, they, I was amazed how late they were to react. And then when they did react, they got a big side skid and um, yeah, it went pretty, pretty ugly pretty quick. But um, hey, yeah, hey ho, you know, it's one of those things that, I, I imagine Ben will be frustrated by it, and it's, it's a bit scary, but it was a good race after that, so it was good that both teams managed to keep racing and have a good battle. Chris, many thanks for your time. Enjoy the victory. I hope uh, you don't have to spend too long repairing the damage, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. So Cheers, congratulations guys. to the Japanese. Wonderful day of racing. Day one. Lots and lots of drama, and surely there will be more to come tomorrow. Six more tomorrow on account of the uh, the bad weather yesterday and the high winds. Sweden against France getting us underway. USA against Great Britain will be one to save us. Second up, Japan against the Kiwi.